The steering wheel felt sticky under my palms as I navigated the last winding road to my new home. The house itself was modern, an appealing contrast against the dense woods that framed the small town of Redwood Grove. I had always had a penchant for forgotten tales and unsolved mysteries, making me perhaps the only history teacher who could feel at home on a site where an old asylum once stood. As I unpacked, I couldn't help but notice fragments of old bricks and bits of charred wood mixed in with the soil of my new garden. These were remnants of a past that the real estate agent had glossed over, remains that hinted at stories buried deep beneath the surface. My curiosity, as ever, got the better of me, urging me to piece together the hidden narrative of this place. A few days later, filled with questions and a growing fascination, I decided to venture into the local pub in hopes of gleaning more about the history of my new property. The pub was quaint, with antique lanterns and walls lined with photographs of Redwood Grove through the ages, a testament to its rich history. I settled at the bar, ordering a pint before casually mentioning my recent finds in the garden. The change in the atmosphere was palpable. The warm chatter cooled, and eyes that had been friendly turned sharp and assessing. The bartender, a burly man with deep-set eyes, leaned in close, his voice a low growl. You best leave those stones where they lie, miss. Some histories are best left undisturbed. His stern advice was echoed by curt nods from others, their faces suddenly closed off and unreadable. The friendly small-town charm had evaporated, replaced by a chilly warning. Undeterred but a touch unnerved, I realized that my curiosity had perhaps dug up more than just the fragments in my garden. Ignoring the subtle and not-so-subtle warnings from the locals, I dove headfirst into the dusty archives of the Redwood Grove Library. The old building was a labyrinth of books and forgotten newspapers, with creaky wooden floors that echoed with each step. I spent days flipping through musty pages and scanning microfiche slides, searching for anything related to the old asylum. Finally, I stumbled upon a series of fragmented newspaper clippings and ambiguous police reports from decades ago, all subtly hinting at a tragic fire and possible cover-ups. Some articles mentioned experimental treatments, but details were scarce, cloaked in cautious phrasing typical of the time. The more I uncovered, the colder the town's reception grew. People I had started to know, faces that had smiled at me when I first arrived, now turned away as I approached. One morning, I found my car with a deep scratch across the door and a note tucked under the windshield wiper, stark against the red paint. Stop digging. But the warnings and isolation only sharpened my resolve. There was a story here, something much bigger than just an old building burning down. And I was going to uncover it, no matter the cost. The tension followed me into the night. My dreams, once rare and forgettable, morphed into vivid nightmares. I was trapped in a raging inferno, the heat suffocating, as I ran down endless smoke-filled corridors. The screams of invisible people filled the air, their pain palpable. Shadowy figures darted through the flames, their faces twisted in agony, reaching out for help that never came. I would wake up drenched in sweat, the echo of their cries lingering in my ears. These nightmares, I realized, were not just stress-induced imaginations. They felt like echoes of real events. The collective trauma of the asylum's past reaching out through the veil of time. Each night, the dreams grew clearer, more intense, as if urging me to look deeper, to not turn away from the horrors that had been buried in this quaint town's beautiful facade. The story of the asylum was like a wound in the heart of Redwood Grove, festering beneath the surface. I was no longer just a history teacher in a new town. I was a seeker of truth, ready to confront whatever secrets lay buried in the shadows of the old asylum. I spent countless hours sifting through the historical archives at the local library. The documents were largely unhelpful, filled with bureaucratic paperwork and ambiguous reports. However, my persistence finally paid off when I discovered a hidden compartment in an old wooden filing cabinet. Inside was a sealed metal box, tarnished and heavy. With a mix of excitement and apprehension, I pried it open. The contents of the box were haunting. A collection of personal belongings, a small cracked photograph of a young woman with a sad smile, a child's rusty tin soldier, and a stack of letters bound by a faded ribbon. 
but it was the diary at the bottom of the box that caught my breath. The leather was worn, the pages yellowed, and the handwriting inside was that of a staff member who had worked at the asylum during its final years. As I read, the chilling truth emerged. The fire that had ravaged part of the asylum was no accident. It was a desperate attempt to destroy evidence of horrific experiments conducted on the patients. I knew this discovery could not stay buried. With the diary and artifacts in hand, I arranged a town meeting, hoping to share the findings and rally support for further investigation. The town hall was packed, the air thick with tension and whispers. As I presented the evidence, murmurs turned into outright hostility. A man in the back, who I later learned was a descendant of the asylum's director, stood up and pointedly accused me of slander and mischief-making, vehemently denying the allegations. The meeting ended in chaos, with no resolution and a divided community. That night, my fears materialized further. I returned home to find my front door ajar, the lock tampered with. Inside, my papers were scattered, and on the kitchen counter lay a blunt message scrawled on a piece of paper, leave town or else. Shaken by the threat but fueled by a deeper resolve, I decided it was time to bring this story to a broader audience. The local sentiment was too entrenched, too biased to confront the horrors of its past. I needed external intervention. I spent the night drafting an email to a major newspaper, attaching photographs of the diary pages and the artifacts. As dawn broke, I hit send, feeling a mix of trepidation and relief. The truth was out there now, beyond the confines of Redwood Grove. It was no longer just my fight. It was a call for justice for those voiceless victims whose lives had been marred by unimaginable horrors. What came next would test the very fabric of this small town, but I was ready to face it, come what may. The publication of the story sparked an uproar that echoed far beyond the boundaries of Redwood Grove. Major newspapers and television networks picked up the tale, each adding layers of investigative journalism to the narrative. Soon, the once quiet town was swamped with reporters and investigators, their cameras and questions unavoidable. This surge of attention shamed some into silence, but spurred others into action. Locals, previously reticent, began to share their own snippets of the asylum's history. Tales handed down from older generations, hidden documents, and even old photographs. Each new piece of evidence lent more weight to my findings, weaving a more detailed tapestry of the truth. The influx of external scrutiny acted as a catalyst, compelling the community to confront its grim past. The stories of abuse and cover-ups, once whispered behind closed doors, were now being broadcast for the world to see validating the forgotten suffering of the asylum's victims. As the full extent of the asylum's dark past came to light, the atmosphere in Redwood Grove began to shift. A second community meeting was called, this time with a different tone. The air was charged with a somber, reflective energy as older residents, some tearful, stepped forward to share poignant family stories tied to the asylum, tales of lost relatives and hushed-up tragedies. These confessions brought the community closer, weaving a collective narrative of remembrance and regret. Moved by these revelations and the weight of national scrutiny, the town council took a decisive step forward. They voted unanimously to establish a memorial at the old asylum site. This memorial would serve not only as a symbol of acknowledgement for the victims, but also as a commitment to preserving and honoring the memory of the past, ensuring that such atrocities would never be forgotten or repeated. When Timmy and I first moved to Eden, it seemed like the perfect place to start anew. The lawns were manicured, the houses pristine, and every neighbor had a welcoming smile. At the community's grand welcoming party, I started noticing just how closely everyone adhered to the neighborhood rules, almost obsessively so. The watch members, friendly yet unnervingly attentive, mingled among us, their eyes always scanning, always noting. It was the first hint that Eden might not be as perfect as it appeared. In the following weeks, the sense of being constantly observed grew overwhelming. No matter the hour, I'd catch glimpses of someone lingering just a bit too long near our windows, or an unmarked van cruising slowly past our home. Timmy, ever so sensitive, clung to me more than usual, whispering about the scary men who watched him play in the yard. 
we felt trapped in an open-air prison where our every move was monitored. It wasn't long before the charming facade of Hidan began to crumble, revealing something far more sinister underneath. It was late one evening when Timmy and I decided to take a shortcut home through a less traveled path behind our block. That's when we saw it. A group of neighborhood watch members standing over what looked like a body. Panicked, I pulled out my phone and started recording, my hands trembling. I thought we were hidden by the shadows, but as we tiptoed away, one of the watchmen turned and looked straight at us. The next morning, I found a note tucked under our doormat. Forget what you saw, for your family's sake. But how could I? Knowing what lay beneath Eden's perfection, how could I possibly forget? The veiled threats escalated quickly. One morning, I found our front door smeared with a dark, sticky substance that reeked of intimidation. Another day, Timmy's beloved bike, left in the yard, was mangled beyond repair. Notes followed, each more ominous than the last, alluding to dangers that might befall us if we continued to be curious. They were watching, always watching, tightening the noose with each passing day. It was a message loud and clear. Conform or suffer. My fear for Timmy's safety grew with each incident, pressing the urgency of our situation deep into my heart. In the midst of our growing despair, Mrs. Kessler, an elderly widow who had always kept to herself, approached me during one of my forced smiles at a community gathering. Her eyes, sharp and knowing, suggested a clandestine solidarity. Over cups of tea in her overly floral living room, she whispered the true history of Eden. It was founded by a group with utopian ideals that had twisted into something dark and controlling. She too had seen too much, suffered losses. With Mrs. Kessler's knowledge and my resolve, we plotted. To the outside, I played the role of a compliant and great a full resident, even volunteering for extra duties, allowing me deeper insights into the community's operations. Using the information gathered during my volunteer hours, I meticulously mapped out our escape, the community's annual festival, lauded for its extravagant fireworks and all-night revelry, provided the perfect cover. I stockpiled essentials, food, water, spare clothes, all hidden in false bottoms of storage bins. I taught Timmy secret codes and signals, turning them into a game so he wouldn't succumb to fear. We rehearsed our route, memorizing each turn and each landmark that would lead us to the old maintenance gate. Mrs. Kessler had told me it was no longer used but fortuitously forgotten in the community's security updates. Each night, after Timmy slept, I lay awake, planning each detail. Each step of our flight from Eden, the weight of our future pressed heavily on me, but the thought of freedom, of safety for Timmy, fortified my resolve. The festival was approaching, and with it, our only chance to disappear into the night, to reclaim the lives that were rightfully ours. The night before the festival, I moved with silent urgency through the shadows of our home, deleting emails and clearing browser histories. Every message I had sent from my phone that could lead them back to us, I erased. I left nothing that could speak of our plans or our fears. In the dim light of early dawn, I meticulously arranged our beds to look as if we were still sleeping, pillows under the covers forming deceiving shapes. Then, with trembling hands, I sent the last email to a journalist I had once met, attaching all the evidence of Eden's dark secrets. It was done. There was no turning back. The festival was in full swing, the air thick with laughter and the sky ablaze with fireworks. Timmy and I, our faces partially obscured by festive masks, moved through the crowd. My heart pounded in my ears with each step, fearing every glance our way was one of suspicion. But the community was engrossed in celebration, oblivious to our silent descent. We reached the old maintenance gate at the edge of Eden. As I fumbled with the lock, a firm hand fell on my shoulder. It was the head of the neighborhood watch, his face grim, knowing. His grip tightened as he leaned in close, his words a hissed warning of the consequences of leaving. But as he spoke, a larger, final burst of fireworks lit up the night. And in that brief, illuminating chaos, I pulled Timmy towards me and shoved the watch leader away with all my might. We ran, the gate swinging open just enough to slip through. Behind us, alarms began to sound, a cacophony rising against the festive noises. We didn't look back not even as the distant sound of sirens grew, signaling the approach of the police. 
Hours later, hidden safely away in the shadows of a quiet diner's back booth, Timmy and I watched the early morning news on a muted television. Images of police cars outside Eden's gates flickered across the screen. A reporter spoke of an investigation, of a community shaken by revelations. We held hands, our grip a silent vow of never returning, of never forgetting. We had escaped Eden, but we had also set the truth free. A year has passed since Timmy and I fled the confining walls of Eden. We now find ourselves in a new town, a place marked by its unremarkable normalcy, which to us feels like a sanctuary. I've exchanged secretive glances and coded whispers for open smiles and community meetings. I'm actively involved with a local group that supports individuals escaping from controlling environments like Eden. It's work that heals both the helper and the helped. And every story shared is a reminder of the shadows we left behind. Timmy, with the resilience only children possess, has blossomed in this fresh soil. His earlier timidity, once a constant companion, has been replaced by a burgeoning confidence. He has friends who know nothing of high walls or watchful eyes. Friends who have only ever known schoolyard games and birthday parties. He's thriving in school, his report card a mosaic of high marks and teacher's praises. A stark contrast to the fearful glances he once cast over his shoulder. I remember the day we moved into our dream house clearly. It was a sunny morning, the kind that promised new beginnings. My wife Laura and our two kids, Mia and Jack, were buzzing with excitement as we pulled into the driveway of our brand new home. It was everything we had hoped for. A spacious modern design nestled in a friendly suburb. We spent that first day unpacking boxes, arranging furniture, and exploring every corner of our new abode, laughter and chatter filling the air. As night fell on our first evening, the house began to settle, and the initial euphoria of the day gave way to tired satisfaction. We tucked Mia and Jack into their new rooms, kissed them goodnight, and retreated to our bedroom, eager for a restful sleep. But as we lay in the darkness, a faint noise drifted through the silence. It was a soft, unsettling scratching, followed by occasional thumping, as if something, or someone, was moving within the walls. At first I thought it was just the house settling, as new houses often do. But as the sounds continued, night after night, it became clear that something was not right. This was no ordinary settling. These were noises with intent, a secret held within the walls of our perfect new home. A week into our new life, the strange noises became an unsettling routine. However, it was Mia, our curious eight-year-old, who unintentionally deepened the mystery. While chasing a runaway marble in her room, she stumbled upon a loose floorboard. With a mix of childlike excitement and naivety, she beckoned us over to reveal her discovery. Hidden beneath the board were a stack of old faded photographs and a bundle of letters, yellowed with age. The photos showed a woman with a gentle smile, her eyes reflecting a somber story yet to be told. The letters were even more intriguing, penned with a desperate hand that detailed loneliness and subtle fear. They weren't dated, but the wear suggested they were old. Our initial excitement about uncovering a piece of forgotten history quickly turned into concern as we pieced together who these might belong to. The architect's wife, who had mysteriously vanished years before our house was built. The news had been a small town legend, one that chilled newcomers and reminded locals of unresolved shadows. Driven by a mixture of concern and curiosity, we decided to look for more clues. Our search led to the discovery of additional hidden compartments throughout the house. Each contained more personal items. A worn-out scarf, a broken watch, a diary with several pages torn out. It seemed every room had its own secret stash, each revealing fragments of a life that whispered tales of distress and perhaps foul play. The implications of our findings were profound. With each new discovery, our initial joy turned into a solemn resolve to uncover the truth. What started as a family adventure was now a serious investigation into the fate of the missing woman, whose life had unknowingly intertwined with ours. We couldn't ignore the pressing questions. Who was she really? What had happened to her? And why were her belongings sealed away behind the walls of our home? As days turned into weeks, the atmosphere within our house shifted from curious to unsettling. 
It wasn't just the hidden compartments that fed our growing unease. Strange occurrences began to pile up, adding layers of fear to our daily lives. Tools from the garage began to vanish, only to reappear in bizarre locations, under beds, in closets, places we had already searched. Our dog, a typically jovial golden retriever, developed a sudden aversion to certain walls, whining and pacing nervously whenever he approached them. The most disturbing aspect, however, was the sensation of being watched. At night, the feeling intensified, a tangible presence that loomed just beyond the reach of our bedside lamps. Seeking explanations, I reached out to our neighbors and the local police. The community's reaction was a mix of sympathy and evasion. While some neighbors offered friendly advice and shared their own minor grievances with new homes, there was a palpable reluctance to discuss anything in depth about the house or its history. The local police were more forthright, albeit in a way that did little to ease our minds. They advised us to focus on settling into our new life and refrain from dredging up a past that could not be changed. Their stern warnings to leave things alone only fueled our suspicions that something more sinister was at play. This lack of support from the community only isolated us further. We were left to grapple with the mystery alone. Every unexplained noise and missing item a reminder that we had stumbled upon something no one wanted uncovered. The walls of our dream home, once symbols of a new beginning, now felt like barriers trapping us with secrets too dangerous to disturb. Our resolve hardened, not just to solve these mysteries for our own sake, but to bring to light whatever was meant to stay hidden. Determined to uncover the truth, we contacted a retired detective who had been marginally involved in the initial investigation of the architect's missing wife. Over coffee, he confessed that he had always harbored suspicions about the architect, but lacked the evidence to prove anything substantive. His belief was that the disappearance was not merely a missing person case, but something more nefarious, possibly even murder. Armed with this new ally and his insights, we returned to our home, more resolved than ever. It was during a thorough search behind the living room's fireplace, a place we had overlooked before, that we made a groundbreaking discovery, a hidden diary. This diary, meticulously kept and painfully honest, detailed the missing woman's fears about her husband's temper and her plans to leave him. It was the definitive proof we needed, a written testament to the fear she lived in and her husband's potential motive. With the diary in hand, we confronted the architect at the annual community fair. The public setting was deliberate, chosen to prevent him from evading the questions as he had done in the past. As we approached him, diary in hand, his face drained of color. Before he could dismiss us, I began reading excerpts aloud. The crowd's murmurs grew louder with each revealed secret. The tension broke when the police, who had been discreetly informed and were waiting in the wings, stepped forward. Faced with the undeniable evidence and the eyes of the community upon him, the architect broke down and confessed to the crime. His arrest followed swiftly, bringing an abrupt end to the ordeal as the fairground buzzed with the shock of the revelation. The truth, long buried within the walls of our home, was finally out. We decided to stay in the house, confronting and overcoming our fears of its haunted past. Plans were made to renovate, not just to repair but to transform and reclaim. We tore down the old walls and built new ones. Each stroke of the hammer, a cathartic release from the shadows that had lurked behind them. We were ecstatic, my family and I, when we finally moved into the old Victorian house on Maple Street. It was the kind of place that you'd swear had its own personality, with creaking floors that whispered secrets of the past and windows that framed the world in soft, dusty light. My husband, Two kids and I had long dreamed of renovating a historical home, and now it was ours. The real adventure began when we decided to expand the living room. Tearing down one of the old plaster walls, we expected dust and maybe some insect damage, but not the treasures we found. Hidden within the hollows of the wall were relics from another era, a collection of old toys, several antique cameras, and a small box containing tape recordings. These were not just forgotten items. They felt like echoes of long lost stories, disturbing yet compelling. We stood there among the debris, holding these artifacts of unknown origins, 
feeling the first tingles of what would become our deep dive into the house's mysterious past. Later that evening, we gathered in the living room, a sense of anticipation hanging in the air, as I inserted the first tape into an old player we found with the recordings. The sounds that filled the room were chilling, disjointed voices, some whispering, some crying, all shrouded in a static haze. It was like listening to ghosts from another time, and the effect was unnerving. Curiosity turned to concern as we decided to research the origins of our new home. It didn't take long to unearth the truth. Our charming Victorian had once housed an orphanage, one marred by grim stories and whispers of children who vanished without a trace. The discovery cast a shadow over our excitement, transforming our renovation project into a quest to uncover what really happened to those lost souls. Our initial trepidation morphed into resolve as my husband Mark and I dove headfirst into a sea of dusty archives and brittle records at the local library. We scanned through old newspapers, land records, and even reached out to a historian who specialized in our town's less savory histories. The lists of children who once lived in the orphanage were long and sorrowful. Many of the names marked with the grim note disappeared. As we pored over these records, a shocking pattern emerged, one that hit much closer to home than we had ever anticipated. Several children who had vanished bore the surname Johnson, an uncommon name in our small town. Digging deeper into my family's ancestry had always been a hobby of mine, but now it turned into a crucial investigative thread. Comparing dates and familial ties, I uncovered undeniable evidence. Some of those missing children were my ancestors. This revelation was staggering. Our family's connection to this house wasn't just through a real estate transaction. It was embedded in its very walls, woven into the tragic tapestry of its history. These children, my distant cousins many times removed, had walked these hallways, maybe played in the same garden where my children now played. Motivated by a newfound duty to my ancestors, we expanded our search. I contacted distant relatives, some of whom, remarkably, had old family letters and photographs. They depicted life in the orphanage. Not just the hardships, but also moments of joy and daily life, adding depth to the names in those dusty lists. As we pieced together the fragments of the past, each document and photograph felt like a tribute to those forgotten children. The more we discovered, the more personal our mission became. Not just to renovate a house, but to restore the memories and dignities of those who had been lost. The journey into our house's past took a decisive turn when the historian confirmed, through census records and old orphanage logs, that indeed several Johnsons listed were my direct ancestors. Each piece of evidence she provided cemented our family's deep, haunting ties to the orphanage, transforming our casual interest into a driven quest for truth. Amidst the piles of documents and photos, we unearthed a faded newspaper clipping that featured a grainy photograph of a shadowy figure reported to be lurking near the orphanage around the time the children disappeared. Witnesses described the figure as eerily silent and foreboding, casting an ominous presence. This article, tucked away with the old tapes, hinted at a darker element at play, suggesting that the disappearances were not merely unfortunate incidents, but perhaps orchestrated. This discovery not only deepened the mystery, but also intensified our resolve. We needed to understand who this figure was and why these children, my ancestors, had vanished. What we found next would challenge everything we thought we knew about our seemingly serene home. After these findings and the chilling accounts from the old newspaper clippings, we decided to reach out to the broader community. Organizing a small gathering at the local community center, we shared our discoveries, hoping to connect with others who might have similar stories or additional information. The response was more overwhelming than we had anticipated. Several elderly attendees, once children of the orphanage or relatives of those who were, came forward with their own accounts, painting a picture of an illegal adoption ring that preyed on the vulnerability of the orphanage's inhabitants. However, not everyone was keen on dredging up the past. We encountered significant obstacles as we pushed for more formal investigations. Local authorities were hesitant, the cases were old, the evidence was mostly anecdotal, and there was a palpable fear of the reputational damage such revelations could inflict on the community. 
Even more disheartening was the resistance from some older community members who preferred the past remain buried, fearful of the secrets that might surface. Despite these setbacks, the pieces of the puzzle continued to align, and the urgency to uncover the full story only grew. We knew we couldn't let these stories remain silenced, not when the truth about what happened to these children, my ancestors, could finally come to light. Our next step was clear. We had to find more tangible evidence within our own home, the very ground zero of this dark history, to bring undeniable proof to those who wish to keep the past in the past. Determined to cut through the swathes of denial and resistance, we organized a larger town hall meeting. The air was tense as the room filled with former orphanage residents and relatives of the missing children, all brought together by a shared need for closure. Amid the gathered crowd, an elderly woman rose to speak, her voice trembling but clear. She had been a young aide at the orphanage and confessed to witnessing firsthand how children were spirited away under cover of night, handed over to strangers in exchange for envelopes stuffed with cash. Her testimony, laden with guilt and regret, provided a chilling account of the orphanage's role in a widespread illegal adoption ring. We returned home to look deeper into the house's secrets. In the attic, behind a false wall, we discovered a hidden room. Inside, stacks of meticulously kept records, more tapes and photographs, provided irrefutable evidence of the transactions. This trove of documents not only corroborated the elderly woman's account, but also detailed the network's operations finally unveiling the dark truth behind the orphanage's facade. With the tangible evidence unearthed from our home, local authorities could no longer ignore the past's shadows. A formal investigation into the orphanage's activities was launched, with the newly found tapes and documents serving as key evidence. The community, once divided, began to find unity in the shared truth and justice for the wronged. The Johnson family spearheaded a memorial project planning a garden with a plaque listing the names of the children who had once called the orphanage home. Yet, amidst our journey of discovery and remembrance, a last twist emerged. Underneath the floorboards of what was once the orphanage's common room, we found another tape. Its contents, a message from an orphan hinting at deeper, still hidden secrets. The voice, young and urgent, reminded us that our search for the truth was far from over. We finally did it. We moved into our own home, a charming old house that whispered tales of decades past with every creaking floorboard and drafty window. It was ours, a place to plant roots, quite literally, as our first family project was to overhaul the neglected backyard. My wife Anna, our two kids Josh and Ellie and I, were all buzzing with ideas and the energy of new beginnings. We envisioned vegetable patches, a new swing set, and maybe a small pond. The excavation began on a crisp Saturday morning. Armed with shovels and boundless enthusiasm, we dug into the earth, which was surprisingly soft and yielding. I was in the midst of discussing flower choices with Ellie when my shovel clinked against something hard. Curious, we all gathered around, brushing away dirt to reveal several old rusty suitcases, much to our astonishment. Heartbeats quickening with the thrill of the unknown, we dragged them out and pried them open right there in the garden. Inside, we found an assortment of personal belongings, faded photographs, clothes that smelled of mothballs, and beneath it all, a collection of yellow documents. As I flipped through them, a ledger filled with meticulous entries of names and numbers caught my eye, hinting at transactions that were anything but ordinary. Little did we know, our dream home was about to plunge us into a hidden world of long-buried secrets and looming threats. That evening, as the kids slept, Anna and I spread the contents of the suitcases across our dining room table under the dim overhead light. Our initial amusement at the vintage personal items quickly evaporated as we examined the ledger more closely. It was a detailed account of names, dates, and financial transactions, all meticulously recorded in fading ink. Some entries were marked with cryptic notations like settled or unfinished. The sheer volume of entries suggested these weren't just personal loans among friends, but something more sinister. The realization hit us hard. The weight of our discovery pressed heavily in the air between us. Anna looked up at me, her face pale. 
What have we gotten ourselves into? I had no answers. Only a growing sense of unease as the history of our dream house began to reveal its dark secrets. The unsettling discovery of the ledger was only the beginning. Within days, the tranquility of our new life was shattered by a series of ominous phone calls. The first few I dismissed as pranks. Until a voice, cold and menacing, made it clear they were anything but. Return what you found, or suffer the consequences. The caller warned before the line went deed. Letters began to appear in our mailbox, each more threatening than the last, all demanding the return of the ledger. The realization that some of the names in that old book were not just echoes from the past, but very real and very dangerous figures in the present criminal underworld sent chills down my spine. These people were desperate to keep their secrets buried, and we were caught in the middle with the key to their hidden skeletons. Late one night, Anna and I sat at our kitchen table, the ledger open between us. We can't just give this back, Anna whispered, fear lacing her voice. Not when it might be the only thing keeping us safe. Her words resonated with a hard truth. If we returned the ledger, we'd lose any leverage we had over the shadows encroaching on our lives. So, we made a decision. We would hold on to the ledger and use it as a shield. I contacted a lawyer friend for advice and drafted an anonymous message to send back to our harassers. We know what's in the ledger. We are prepared to go to the police if our family comes to any harm. It was a risky bluff, especially since we were uncertain of just how deep and dark the roots of this conspiracy ran. Our gamble sent a clear signal. We weren't going to be easy targets. But as I sent that message, part of me knew we were stepping deeper into a game that was far bigger and more dangerous than anything we could have imagined. Determined to protect our family yet desperate to end the nightmare, we chose to contact one of the less menacing names listed in the ledger. Through a secure, anonymous email, we offered a trade. The ledger for our safety. The response was swift and terse, agreeing to meet at an abandoned warehouse at the edge of town. The stakes were high, but we felt this was our best chance to sever ties with this hidden world. The night before the meeting, Anna and I sat down with the kids at the dinner table. We didn't disclose the full danger of the situation, but we stressed the importance of staying with their grandparents for a few days. Just a little vacation while mom and dad take care of some grown-up stuff, I explained, masking my anxiety with a forced smile. After dropping the kids off, Anna and I prepared for every conceivable outcome. I contacted our lawyer friend again, giving him details of the meeting and instructing him to act if he didn't hear from us within a few hours. We packed a small bag with essentials, including a discreetly placed voice recorder to document the exchange. Our every move was calculated, yet as we drove to the warehouse, the weight of our decision pressed heavily on us. This was it, a pivotal moment on which our future hinged. The warehouse loomed before us, a silent behemoth in the twilight, its walls scarred with graffiti. Our hearts pounded in unison as we parked the car in the shadow of the structure and proceeded on foot, the ledger secure in my backpack. The air was thick with the acrid smell of old oil and rust as we entered the cavernous space. Inside, figures emerged from the darkness. Their faces were hard and unreadable, their eyes reflecting no emotion. The leader, a tall man with a scar tracing down his cheek, stepped forward. The ledger, he demanded gruffly, his hand extended. As I reached into my backpack, every nerve in my body screamed in tension. I handed over the ledger, and for a moment, there was a heavy silence as he flipped through it. Just as he nodded to his companions, a sudden cacophony of sirens wailed in the distance, growing louder. The criminals tensed, eyes darting toward the sound. The police, led by our family friend from the force, stormed into the warehouse. Lights flashed, and officers shouted commands. Caught by surprise, the criminals were quickly subdued and handcuffed. Our family friend approached, his expression a mix of relief and sternness. You shouldn't have had to do this, he said, clapping a reassuring hand on my shoulder as the police began securing the scene. Relief washed over us in an overwhelming wave. The intervention was timely and decisive, pulling us back from the brink of a potentially disastrous confrontation. Our gamble had paid off, 
but the real implications of our actions were just beginning to dawn on us. As the dust settled and the last of the suspects were led away, our family friend and officer, Sergeant Miller, joined us away from the chaos. His usual composed demeanor was replaced by a reflective, almost remorseful expression. There's something you need to know about why I've been so involved, he began, his voice low. He revealed that the original owner of our house was his great uncle, a man whose life had spiraled into the underworld, tainting their family name with criminal associations. When you found the ledger and these threats began, I saw a chance to right some of the wrongs, to clear our family's name and protect yours, he explained. The revelation added layers to our tumultuous experience, intertwining our fate with his in ways we had never imagined. Sergeant Miller's personal stake in the matter had driven him to ensure our safety, bridging past and present in a bid for redemption and justice. In the quiet of our new home, far from the shadows of the past, Anna and I watched the kids play, their laughter a soothing balm. As we unpacked the last of the boxes, Ellie, our youngest, called out from the attic, Look what I found. Her small hands held open a secret compartment hidden beneath the floorboards. Inside, an array of old, dusty letters lay waiting. As our eyes met over her discovery, the familiar thrill of curiosity was tempered with a cautious edge. Our new chapter had just begun, and already, the pages seemed filled with whispers of secrets yet to be revealed. The moment I stepped onto the sprawling grounds of my great-uncle's estate, a chill ran through me. Not from the crisp autumn air, but from the sheer isolation of the place. Nestled deep within dense woods, the mansion stood as a lonely sentinel, its towering silhouette that seemed to whisper secrets of a forgotten past. My great-uncle, a reclusive and somewhat eccentric doll maker, had lived and died here leaving the property to me by some twist of familial fate. As I pushed open the heavy front door, the air inside smelled of dust and disuse, the kind of stagnation that speaks to years without a living soul to stir its corners. The main hall was lined with portraits, their eyes seeming to follow my every step. It was in the deeper rooms of the house that I found them, dozens of dolls arranged with painstaking care on shelves and in display cases. Each was beautifully crafted, with faces so lifelike and expressions so detailed, they seemed on the verge of speaking. The dolls weren't just masterpieces of artistry. They were unnervingly real. A room further into the mansion held a wall covered in photographs, pictures of children, each frozen in time. My stomach turned as I realized the dolls bore a disturbing resemblance to these children. The eyes that seemed to follow me around the room weren't just in the paintings anymore. They were in the glassy gazes of these dolls, each one silently telling a story I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. This was my initial encounter with my great-uncle's legacy, a legacy that felt as eerie as the shadows lengthening outside as the sun began to set. As the days lengthened into my first week at the estate, my curiosity drove me deeper into the heart of my great-uncle's world. Within the musty corners of his study, I uncovered stacks of old personal diaries and scattered police reports. The writings revealed more than just the ramblings of a solitary doll maker. They hinted at something darker. The police reports were inquiries into several children who had mysteriously disappeared over the years, cases that grew cold and were eventually forgotten by everyone but those who had lost. Venturing into town, I hoped to gather more than just supplies. The locals, however, were not as welcoming as I had hoped. Their eyes were cautious, their words measured. In the town's quaint diner, overheard conversations paused as I approached, resuming only when I'd passed. It was Mrs. Eldridge, the owner of the diner, who, after some hesitation, finally spoke to me. Your great uncle was a strange man, she said, pouring coffee with a trembling hand. People here, they wondered about him, about those dolls and the children who vanished. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Some say he took those kids made them into those dolls of his. The weight of her words hung heavy in the air as I walked back to the mansion, the echoes of the past whispering with each step. Determined to uncover the truth, I returned to the doll workshop, a room I had avoided since my first unsettling discovery. It was there, behind a false wall I accidentally discovered, 
when a misplaced doll fell and tapped against it hollowly, that I found the hidden door. With a mix of dread and resolve, I pushed the door open, revealing a narrow staircase spiraling down into darkness. At the bottom, I found a secret chamber, meticulously organized and preserved. The air was cool and still, as if sealed away from the world above. Along the walls were shelves filled with personal items, small shoes, worn toys, hair ribbons frayed with age. Each item was tagged and cataloged with obsessive precision. Photographs of children, the same ones from the wall upstairs, were pinned next to detailed records and beside each, a corresponding doll. My hands trembled as I realized the extent of what I was seeing. This secret room was a shrine, a morbid memorial to each missing child. The dolls weren't just figures of art, they were effigies, capturing the essence of children who had once laughed, played, and then vanished. The realization that my great uncle might have been involved in something so heinous was overwhelming. I needed answers, and I knew they were hidden here, within these walls and the cryptic writings he left behind. My resolve hardened. I would uncover the truth, no matter how dark it might be. In the eerie silence of the secret chamber, I pored over the meticulous records my great uncle had left behind. Each entry was a biography of a lost child, detailing not just their life and sudden disappearance, but also the precise manner in which their doll was crafted. The dolls, I realized with a chilling clarity, were more than mere memorials. They were vessels, capturing the essence of each child in haunting detail. My hands shook as I read, the doll's glassy eyes watching me from their perches. As I dived deeper into my great uncle's diaries, a narrative began to unfold, one that painted a picture of a man torn between genius and madness. He wrote of the world's cruelty, of children lost to neglect and abuse, and of his mission to save them. In their new form they are loved and cherished forever, he penned in a shaky scrawl. Here, they are safe, forever children in a sanctuary of their own. His words twisted a knife of doubt in my mind. Was he a protector warped by his own grief, or a predator cloaked in delusional benevolence? My days were consumed by the investigation, each discovery dragging me further away from the world outside. Nights were spent wandering the halls of the mansion, where whispers of the past seemed to echo through the air, a constant reminder of the legacy I now shouldered. The local community, already distant, grew openly hostile. Whispers turned to wary glances, then to outright avoidance. The old grocer, Mr. Hawkins, his voice trembling with suspicion, finally voiced the village's fears one morning. Your uncle was no saint, and now strange things happen since you've come back. Just what are you up to in that old house of yours? The tension in town escalated when a local child went missing. A young boy who had wandered too close to my estate, they said. The timing was disastrous. As search parties formed and police inquiries began, the pointed fingers turned my way. The situation forced me to a decision point. Could I continue this solitary investigation with the town against me? Or should I reveal all and seek help? Choosing transparency, I invited the sheriff and a small group of locals to view the secret chamber, to see the truth of my great uncle's obsession. Their horror mirrored my own as they took in the rows of dolls, the wall of photographs, and the detailed logs of each child's life and transformation. He thought he was saving them, I explained, my voice hollow. He believed the world had abandoned these children, and this was his way of keeping them safe. Forever. The revelation did not bring the understanding I had hoped for. Instead, it sowed deeper seeds of fear and mistrust. As I stood before the community, their faces a mix of horror, sorrow, and suspicion, I realized that my quest for answers had only deepened the shadows cast by my family's legacy. Yet, amidst the chaos, an unexpected ally emerged. Ms. Eldridge, the diner owner, whose own sister had vanished years ago, Let's find the truth once and for all, she whispered to me, her eyes resolute. Together we resolved to dig deeper, to unravel the full story behind each doll. Perhaps in doing so, we could restore the missing pieces of the town's heart, pieces that had been lost to fear and time. 
I knew that each step would take us closer to either redemption or damnation, and I prayed silently that we were ready for either. As the autumn leaves began their descent, signaling the end of one season and the start of another, I sat in the dim light of the workshop, the final diary of my great uncle open before me. His words were etched with a frantic urgency, a stark contrast to the precise, meticulous entries of his earlier journals. This was his confession, a raw outpouring of a troubled mind. My creations are not mere playthings, he wrote, his handwriting deteriorating into an almost illegible scrawl. They are protection for souls too pure for this cruel world. I have seen the forgotten tears of children, heard the silent screams of despair. They come to me, lost and forsaken, and I do what I must to protect them. It was a chilling admission of his life's work, abducting children he viewed as neglected or endangered, then preserving their likenesses in his dolls. He saw himself not as a kidnapper, but as a guardian angel, rescuing them from a world that, in his eyes, had failed them. I sat back, the weight of his words pressing down on me. The line between madness and benevolence had blurred into obscurity in his mind. My resolve hardened in that moment, knowing what I had to do. His actions, though perhaps well-intentioned, had caused irreparable harm. Families were torn apart, lives shattered by his misguided crusade. The truth needed to come out. I picked up the phone, dialing the number for the local police. My voice was steady as I reported my findings, requesting an official investigation into the children linked to the dolls found in the chamber. I outlined everything. The secret room, the detailed records, and the diary entries that confessed the harrowing truth. The police were quiet on the other end, absorbing the gravity of the revelations, before promising to send detectives to the estate. The decision to go public was not taken lightly. I knew that revealing this would forever alter the legacy of my family. The name that I carried would be marred by scandal and horror. Yet, as I prepared to face the inevitable public scrutiny and backlash, a sense of duty fortified me. This was about justice for those children and their families, about bringing peace to souls that had been restless for far too long. As I waited for the police to arrive, I walked through the rows of glassy-eyed dolls, each a monument to a lost child. The workshop, once a place of eerie stillness, now felt like a chamber of echoes, the whispered goodbyes of children who could finally hope for closure. This was the end of one chapter and the painful beginning of another, where truth, no matter how dark, would shine a light on the past. When the police arrived at the estate, they conducted a methodical and comprehensive investigation. The records I had uncovered in the secret chamber proved crucial allowing them to confirm the identities of several missing children. As the scope of the tragedy unfolded, the local community's initial suspicion melted into a somber understanding. Neighbors and townsfolk, once wary and distant, began to offer their assistance, participating in the investigation and providing any information that could shed more light on the decades-long mystery. As I watched the police carry away the dolls, each a silent sentinel of a child's stolen innocence. A profound sadness enveloped me. The weight of my family's legacy pressed heavily upon my shoulders. Reflecting on the complex tapestry of my great uncle's actions, his misguided attempt to protect and preserve the essence of these children, I resolved to transform this place of sorrow into one of remembrance. The mansion, with its dark secrets now exposed, would become a memorial museum dedicated to the lost children. My hope was that it would serve as both a sanctuary for their memories and a cautionary tale about the intricate and often perilous nature of human intentions. This place, marked by both pain and care, would stand as a testament to the enduring impact of our choices and the possibility of redemption through truth. We had just moved into what you might call the house of the future, a state-of-the-art smart home nestled on the outskirts of town surrounded by whispering pines and a sense of new beginnings. Tom and I had always been tech enthusiasts, and this place, with its promise of an automated lifestyle, was a dream come true. Our two children, Mia, a typical 15-year-old with her nose often in her smartphone, and little Sam, who was just eight and fascinated by anything with buttons, shared our excitement. 
It felt like we were stepping into a new, easier era of living. But our fascination began to wane as the house started to show a different kind of intelligence. One night, just a week after we moved in, the TV in our living room sprang to life at 3 a.m., flickering to static that filled the house with a low, crackling hum. Tom and I shuffled downstairs half asleep, bewildered at the sight. It was probably just a glitch, we reasoned. Or maybe we hadn't figured out the settings yet. Over the next few days, other odd things began to happen. Lights would flicker off and on in the hallway, casting eerie shadows against the walls as we walked by. Sometimes late at night I could hear faint, indistinct noises coming from the speakers in various rooms, like distant conversations being played at a volume just too low to comprehend. Each time, Tom would check the system, tweak a few settings, and reassure the kids that it was nothing more than our new home, adjusting to us just as we were adjusting to it. We laughed these malfunctions off as part of the learning curve of living in a digital fortress. Little did we know, our home was learning us too. The oddities in our new home escalated quickly from minor nuisances to outright invasive disturbances. It began subtly. First, the smart cameras in the living room and hallways flickered to life at odd hours, even when no one was around to trigger them. Then, the thermostat settings started to change on their own. I would wake up in the middle of the night, shivering as the temperature inexplicably dropped, turning our warm refuge into a cold, unwelcoming space. Mia, always the inquisitive one and more adept with technology than even myself, began to suspect something more sinister than mere technical glitches. One Saturday morning, driven by a mix of curiosity and growing unease, she decided to dive into the home security system. What she found sent chills down my spine far colder than the unexplained drops in temperature. There were hours upon hours of footage, videos of us sleeping, eating, talking, videos that none of us had initiated. It was as if an unseen observer had taken up residence with us, watching our every move. The most disturbing part was seeing the timestamp on some of the recordings showing us asleep in our beds while the camera zoomed in and out, as if trying to capture every detail. The invasion of our privacy was palpable, and fear began to seep into every corner of our once safe haven. After Mia showed us the recordings, we gathered as a family in the living room, the seriousness of our situation sinking in. Someone, somewhere, was puppeteering our smart home to spy on us. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I called an old college friend, Derek, who now worked in cybersecurity. Over the phone, I explained our bizarre and frightening situation. Sensing the urgency, he came over the next day with his equipment, ready to dissect our network for clues. Derek worked tirelessly, his fingers flying over the keyboard as he navigated through lines of code and system logs. After hours of digging, he unearthed the unsettling truth. We had been hacked. The hacker had not only breached our network but had been actively controlling it, lurking in our digital shadows for weeks. The thought that someone had been observing us for that long learning our routines and watching our intimate moments was horrifying. The discovery of the breach was a turning point. Knowing we were victims of a calculated invasion rather than victims of haunted technology was both a relief and a call to arms. We needed to protect our family, regain our privacy, and ensure this could never happen again. As Derek began implementing stronger security measures, I realized our fight had just begun. The hacker was still out there, and now that we were aware of their presence, I feared what they might do next. Derek, our cybersecurity expert, was hunched over his laptop, his eyes scanning the screen with a focus that belied the late hour. His coffee cup sat forgotten, cold on the kitchen table where we had set up our makeshift command center. I think I've got something, he finally muttered, breaking the tense silence. Using advanced network tracing tools, Derek had managed to isolate and trace the IP address that had been accessing our system. It was local, much closer than any of us had anticipated. My heart pounded as he handed me a slip of paper with an address scribbled on it. The reality that the person invading our lives was so nearby sent a shiver through me. Without hesitation, we contacted the local police. Given the severity of the situation and the evidence Derek provided, they acted quickly. A team was dispatched to the address and I insisted on going with them. As we drove through the quiet streets of our town, every shadow seemed sinister, 
Every streetlight flickered like an ominous warning. It the address led us to a nondescript house on the edge of town. The police entered first, calling out, but there was no response. I followed cautiously behind, my stomach in knots. Inside, the scene was chilling. A room filled with monitors, each displaying different live feeds from numerous homes. Our living room, Mia's bedroom, the kitchen. Our private spaces exposed on these screens. It was like walking into the belly of a voyeuristic beast. The police secured the house and began their search for evidence. Amidst the technological setup, they found photos and documents that led to a shocking revelation. The hacker was no random criminal. He was a disgraced former employee of the smart home company that had installed our system. Fired for misconduct, he had turned his intricate knowledge of the system's vulnerabilities into a tool for revenge and chaos. This personal connection to the company explained the ease with which he had manipulated our smart home. He wasn't just a hacker. He was a spurned insider, using his expertise to terrorize and control families, mine included. As the police gathered evidence and began piecing together the extent of his crimes, I stood amidst the monitors, watching as officers turned off each screen. One by one, the images blinked out, and with each click, a small part of our privacy was restored. The relief was palpable, but the violation we had suffered would take much longer to heal. After the hacker was arrested, the veil of safety that a home is supposed to provide felt irreparably torn. The intrusion into our private lives left a deep scar. Each of us processed the shock differently. Tom grew more protective, constantly checking the locks and security settings, while Mia retreated inward, her bright spirit dimmed by the knowledge that someone had watched her most private moments. Determined not to let this ordeal define us, we decided to channel our experience into something positive. We launched a campaign to raise awareness about digital security, sharing our story publicly to highlight the vulnerabilities, even in the most advanced systems. Our living room, once the site of silent surveillance, became our stage for webinars and interviews, guiding others on securing their homes against digital intruders. This initiative not only helped mend our sense of control, but also brought us closer as a family. United by our resolve, we turned our painful experience into a force for good, ensuring that no other family would have to endure what we went through. We decided to leave the smart home behind, choosing a less connected, simpler lifestyle in a new house where manual switches replaced voice commands and sensor activations. This move wasn't just about changing our address. It was about reclaiming our sense of security and autonomy. As we unpacked boxes in our new home, the familiar sounds of laughter and conversation slowly began to replace the eerie silence that technology had imposed on us. In the tranquil glow of our new living room, we gathered as a family, free from the relentless hum of technology. Embracing this fresh start, we were mindful of our past trials, but optimistic about a more guarded, secure future, cherishing the simple, unmonitored moments together. I've always cherished solitude. Amid the bustling chaos that defined urban living, I found my peace in the quiet moments. Early mornings when the city still slumbered, late nights when the streets emptied of their daily throngs. This love for tranquility guided my decision to move to a new city, a place where I could start over with a clean slate, where memories didn't cling to the corners of buildings, and faces in the crowd were all unfamiliar to me. Here in this sprawling metropolis that buzzed with strangers, I sought my fresh start. I relished the anonymity, the freedom to rebuild myself away from the prying eyes of a past that had become too heavy to bear. My new apartment was a modest but cozy space, nestled on the quieter side of town. Work became a necessary intrusion into my carefully curated isolation, a demanding job that nonetheless offered the routine I had craved. It was predictable, manageable, Life, for a few precious months, felt pleasantly uneventful. However, I would soon learn that tranquility was a fragile state. It began with a niggling sensation, the kind that tugs at the edges of awareness. A car, nondescript and black, lingered a little too long in my rearview mirror as I drove home from work. Once, twice, perhaps it was nothing, a coincidence of timing, I told myself. But as days bled into weeks, 
The car's presence wove itself into the fabric of my daily commute, an unsettling shadow trailing my movements. Initially, I dismissed the feeling, chiding myself for succumbing to baseless paranoia. Yet the human mind is finely tuned to detect patterns, and what I pieced together refused to be ignored. The repetition of the car's appearances, always a few turns behind, transformed my dismissal into concern. This unease was new, an unfamiliar weight in my stomach. I had moved to escape ghosts, only to find myself haunted by a very real specter in the form of a vehicle that seemed as much a part of my journey home as the streets I navigated. In the weeks that followed, my home, once a bastion of safety, began to betray me. It started so small and inconsequential that I could almost convince myself I was imagining things. A book misplaced, not on the shelf where I was certain I'd left it, but on the coffee table. My keys, always hung by the door, found in the kitchen. These discrepancies niggled at me, sowing seeds of doubt in the routines I had so meticulously established. Then, there was the scent, an odd, indefinable aroma that didn't belong. It was neither unpleasant nor familiar, a melange of something metallic mixed with the earthiness of aftershave, lingering in the air like a ghostly presence. It clung to my living room some evenings, greeting me as I returned from work, a silent testament to an uninvited visitor. Most disturbing, however, was the shadow. On one particularly ordinary evening, as I moved about my kitchen, a movement at the periphery of my vision caught my attention. A fleeting glimpse of something or someone passing by my living room window. I froze, my heart hammering, and rushed to peer outside, only to find the street empty, bathed in the orange glow of the streetlights. The curtains, I could have sworn, were drawn when I had gotten home. Confusion turned to fear, and fear bred isolation. I reached out, first to friends, then to the local police, in search of explanations, validation, or perhaps just to hear someone else say they believe me. But reassurance was scant. Friends offered well-meaning platitudes, suggesting perhaps I was overworked, stressed, or simply not yet accustomed to my new home. The police were polite but clear, without evidence of forced entry or theft. There was little they could do. They left me with a pamphlet on home security and suggestions to change my locks, but no real solace. This lack of belief, this dismissal of my concerns, left me adrift in my own mind, questioning my sanity. The solidity of my reality, once unquestionable, now seemed permeable, subject to distortions that left me grappling for truth. Nightfall brought no relief, each creak and whisper of my apartment a potential herald of unseen intrusion. Sleep, when it came, was fitful, plagued by dreams of shadows and the sensation of being watched. I found myself caught in a space where the boundary between the real and imagined blurred. The solitude I once sought now felt like a sentence, a confinement with my burgeoning fears for company. The very walls that were meant to protect me seemed complicit in my torment, keeping silent vigil over my unraveling. In this state of heightened vigilance, I began to see my world through a lens tinted with suspicion and dread. Every unexplained sound, every slight anomaly in my home's order became evidence of my unseen adversary's presence. This escalation of events did more than just invade my personal space. It breached the fortress of my mind, planting seeds of terror that took root deep within my psyche. I was left to navigate a reality where the line between paranoia and legitimate fear became increasingly indistinguishable. Determined to confront my fears head-on, I steeled myself for the inevitable encounter. It came on an evening painted with the strokes of an ordinary sunset, the kind that previously would have passed without remark. The black car, its presence now a constant in the tapestry of my daily life, was there again. This time, however, it followed me all the way to my parking lot, unraveling the last thread of my patience. With a courage born of desperation, I approached the vehicle, my steps echoing in the silent street. The driver's door opened, and out stepped a figure, shrouded in the dimming light. A man, unfamiliar, his features cast into shadow by the failing light, stood before me. My heart raced, not with fear, but with a burning need for answers. I'm not here to hurt you, the stranger began, his voice laced with an urgency that made me pause. I'm trying to protect you. Before I could fully process his words, 
A sudden disturbance shattered the moment. A noise from my apartment. Together, we rushed towards my home. An uneasy truce between us forged in the face of a common threat. What we discovered inside turned my world on its head. Hidden cameras, expertly placed to capture every corner of my living space, blinked back at us. The invasion I had felt, the eyes I had sensed upon me, had not been the imaginings of a mind pushed to the brink. They were real. But the man before me, whom I had labeled as my stalker, was just as much a victim. He explained hurriedly how he had noticed the car first, how his attempts to warn me had been misinterpreted. He too had felt the weight of unseen eyes, noticing similar devices in his own home after he had taken an interest in my safety. The realization dawned on me like a cold wave. The true architect of our fear remained cloaked in the shadows of anonymity, manipulating us both in a sinister game of voyeurism. The presence of the cameras, their silent testimony to countless observed moments, suggested a plot far more disturbing than a simple case of stalking. Someone, for reasons unknown, was orchestrating our fears, feeding off our paranoia like a parasite. This twist of fate, the revelation that my presumed stalker was, in fact, an ally, forced me to reassess my situation. Together, we faced not just the invasion of my privacy, but a deeper, more pervasive threat. The identity of our watcher, the mastermind behind the lenses, remained a mystery. One that promised to unravel the very fabric of our reality. With the revelation that my stalker was, in fact, another pawn in this disturbing game, I found myself in an unlikely alliance. The man, whom I learned was named Lucas, shared my determination to unearth the identity of our observer. Together, we embarked on a mission fueled by the need for answers and justice, a mission that would require all our cunning and bravery. Our first step was to trace the origin of the surveillance equipment. It was a painstaking process, involving late-night research sessions, poring over manuals, and following the tangled web of technology that had invaded our lives. We discovered that the devices were not the off-the-shelf variety, but rather specialized equipment that required professional knowledge to install and operate. This clue narrowed our list of suspects significantly. As we delved deeper, we uncovered a network of signals that led us to a most unexpected source. Our neighbor, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson was a retiree, a seemingly benign presence in the building who often greeted us with a smile and small talk about the weather. His demeanor was the perfect cover for the malice that lurked beneath. Confronting Mr. Thompson required a plan. We could not simply accuse him without undeniable proof of his involvement. Thus, Lucas and I decided to turn the tables on our watcher. Using our newfound knowledge, we tampered with the surveillance equipment, sending false signals to lead Mr. Thompson into a trap. The trap was set in my apartment, the scene of so many violations of my privacy. We waited, tense and silent. As Mr. Thompson took the bait, he entered the apartment, confident in his control over the situation, only to find Lucas and me waiting for him, our faces grim with accusation. The confrontation that followed was tense. Mr. Thompson, realizing his scheme had unraveled, oscillated between denial and anger before finally breaking down and confessing. His motives were as chilling as they were unfathomable. He spoke of a twisted obsession with me, a desire to control and manipulate my environment to make me dependent on him. He saw himself as a guardian, albeit one who had crossed into the realm of criminality. Lucas and I listened, horror-struck by the depth of Mr. Thompson's delusion. We had expected to confront a predator, but what we found was a man lost in his own distorted reality. Yet, the danger he posed was no less real. With the confession secured, we called the police, who arrived to take Mr. Thompson into custody. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. The immediate threat had been neutralized. Mr. Thompson was now in the hands of the authorities, his array of surveillance equipment confiscated, and his intentions laid bare. The ordeal had left scars, undoubtedly, but also a resilient bond between two strangers who had become allies in the face of adversity. But just as I began to envision a return to normalcy, a chilling reminder of my vulnerability arrived. A text message from an unknown number pierced the fragile bubble of my newfound security. 
You think you've won, but you're still being watched. The message was cryptic, its source untraceable, reigniting the ember of fear that I had fought so hard to extinguish. In the ensuing days, my efforts to trace the message proved futile. It was as if the sender existed in the shadows, beyond the reach of light. This realization, that our victory over Mr. Thompson might have been but a battle in a larger war, cast a long shadow over my recovery. As the final words of my ordeal whispered into silence, I found myself drawn to the window, gazing out into the night. The city stretched out before me, a maze of lives unknowingly observed, each light a potential eye, each shadow a concealment for darker intents. My reflection in the glass, superimposed on this panorama, served as a poignant metaphor for the duality of my existence. The day I stepped into the house Elias built, I was awash with a sense of achievement and wonder. He wasn't just my mentor. In the world of architecture, he was akin to a deity. His final gift to me, this house, was a testament to his genius and innovation. I was ready to start a new chapter of my life within its walls, blissfully unaware of the intricate web I was about to entangle myself in. Before Elias became an enigma, he was a visionary whose passion for architecture knew no bounds. We met on a rain-soaked afternoon at a lecture hall, where his ideas about buildings as living entities first captured my imagination. Architecture, he said, his eyes alight with fervor, is the silent witness to our lives, shaping us as much as we shape it. Our ensuing mentorship was not merely an exchange of knowledge but of dreams and doubts. As his final project loomed, Elias grew distant, consumed by his creation. This house was his magnum opus, a secret even to me until his last breath revealed its existence. Understanding his isolation now, amidst his architectural legacy, I see the brilliance and madness that danced in tandem within his mind. The exterior of the house was a spectacle of modern design, a harmonious blend of glass and steel that seemed to dance with the surrounding wilderness. Inside, it was an embodiment of light, with walls that shifted and floors that seemed to breathe. It was a living entity, a marvel of technology and design that promised a utopia. But the marvel began to morph into a mystery. The first sign was subtle. A chair I remembered pushing in was found pulled out the next morning. I shrugged it off as forgetfulness. But then, the anomalies grew harder to ignore. Rooms I left set for breakfast greeted me rearranged for dinner. Doors I had left ajar were found firmly locked, and windows that once offered a view of the dawn now reflected only the night. Driven by a mix of curiosity and unease, I scoured the house for answers. It was in a concealed niche behind a seemingly ordinary bookshelf in the library that I found Elias's journals. They were filled with his thoughts on architecture's potential, not just to shelter, but to influence, to control. The house, his crowning achievement, was more than a home. It was an experiment in shaping human behavior through design. I was the subject of that experiment. The realization struck me with chilling clarity. My mentor's legacy, this architectural wonder, was a meticulously designed cage. Night after night, the house unveiled its challenges. Corridors twisted into mazes at the flick of a switch. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, taunting me, and puzzles embedded in the very fabric of the house tested my resolve. Ilias's game was one of endurance, of psychological warfare. The house seemed to mock me with its shifting shadows, a silent challenger to my resolve. One evening, as I traced my fingers along the cool, smooth surface of the marble countertop, a sudden chill enveloped the room. The hairs on my neck stood on end, not just from the cold, but from a realization that crept up on me like the shadows that now seemed to linger longer than before. It wasn't just the house that was changing. I was too. Fear, a constant companion, had begun to morph into something else, a gritty determination. I hadn't spoken a word, but the house, in its eerie silence, had heard my unspoken vow. I would not be broken. As days turned into nights within the confines of the house, I discovered a room I hadn't noticed before. It was starkly empty, except for a single antique chessboard set up as if a game was in progress. A note beside it, 
in Elias's handwriting, challenged me to finish the game. Each move I made triggered changes in the house. Some rooms expanded, offering brief respite or clues, while others contracted, their walls inching closer with a suffocating inevitability. The game became a metaphor for my struggle. Each piece moved a step closer to salvation or doom. One evening, as thunder rumbled ominously outside, the house's lighting system flickered erratically, casting shadows that twisted and stretched in the corners of my vision. In this chaos, I stumbled upon Elias' studio, untouched since his last day. The room was filled with architectural models and drawings, each more fantastical and abstract than the last. Amidst them, I found a model of the house, but with one striking difference. A hidden room marked Elias's sanctuary. My heart raced as I realized this could be the key to understanding the house's secrets. Determined to find this sanctuary, I embarked on a meticulous search, pressing against walls and scouring each room for hidden mechanisms. The breakthrough came unexpectedly. I had noticed a pattern in the shifting walls and, following a hunch, I traced the movements back to their source. A hidden panel in the basement slid away to reveal what I could only describe as the house's nerve center. A room filled with monitors, controls, and blueprints. The architectural heart of Elias's experiment. And there, amidst the tangle of blueprints, was the failsafe. A complex series of switches and buttons that promised liberation. It was Elias's final challenge, a puzzle that required not just architectural insight, but a deep understanding of the man himself. The house did not yield easily. With every step I took towards freedom, it countered with a new, more sinister obstacle. Floors that gave way to reveal depths unknown, walls that closed in, threatening to crush me, and illusions that played on my deepest fears. But I persevered, that architecture was as much about people as it was about buildings. Each puzzle solved brought me closer to the truth, not just about the house, but about the man who built it. Elias had sought to create a legacy that transcended time, but in his quest, he had lost sight of the ethical boundaries that should have guided him. When I finally activated the failsafe, the house shuddered as if in defeat. Doors unlocked, windows cleared, and for the first time in what felt like an eternity, I stepped outside. The world seemed different, as if I was seeing it for the first time again. I had survived Elias's final experiment, but the victory was bittersweet. The house stood silent behind me, a monument to a brilliant mind that had strayed too far into the abyss. I knew then that I couldn't simply walk away. The story of the house, of Elias's brilliance and his fall, needed to be told. I documented everything, publishing the journals and sharing the tale of the house that sought to control its inhabitant. The house remains, sealed and under study, a cautionary tale of ambition unchecked by morality. And I, forever changed by the experience, dedicated myself to a new cause, promoting ethical architecture. Through a foundation established in Elias's name, I sought to ensure that his brilliance would inspire future generations but that his mistakes would serve as a reminder of the lines we must not cross. In the aftermath, the house became a part of me, its lessons etched into my soul. It had been a prison, a puzzle, and ultimately, a teacher. Within its walls, I had faced my fears, discovered my strength, and learned the true price of legacy. As I move forward, I carry with me the memories of that time, a testament to the power of architecture to shape lives, the house taught me that while we may design the spaces we live in, it is our choices that define us. When we first moved into our dream home in a quiet suburb, the world seemed wrapped in perfection. The house was a quaint two-story building with a welcoming porch and a spacious backyard, ideal for summer barbecues and family gatherings. The streets were lined with towering trees, and the neighbors always seemed to have a smile ready. Everything around us whispered promises of peaceful days and happy memories. Yet, this idyllic setting soon revealed a shadow in the form of our next door neighbor, Mr. Grayson. Initially, he seemed the epitome of neighborly charm, always ready with a friendly wave or eager to share local history. However, his behavior quickly became unsettling. 
Mr. Grayson watched us from his windows at strange hours and would appear suddenly in our yard, claiming to check on a stray plant from his garden. His attentiveness felt more intrusive than friendly. His eyes, sharp and probing, seemed to catch every detail, and his frequent presence at the edge of our property gradually transformed our initial comfort into a persistent unease. As the weeks slipped by, Mr. Grayson's behavior grew even more disconcerting. One afternoon, while we were tending to the garden, he leaned over the fence, his voice low and tinged with a dark seriousness. You know, this land isn't just dirt and grass, he murmured, glancing around as if afraid of being overheard. There are stories here, secrets that can make your blood run cold. His cryptic words hung heavy in the air, and when I pressed him for more details, he simply shook his head and retreated to his house, leaving a chill down my spine. Driven by a mix of curiosity and unease, I ventured into our attic one rainy evening to see if the house held any clues about Mr. Grayson's vague insinuations. Amidst boxes of old decorations and forgotten furniture, I stumbled upon a tattered box filled with various papers and a newspaper clipping that caught my eye. The headline was grim, reporting a series of unexplained disappearances in our area dating back decades, around the time the neighborhood was first developed. The article was unsettlingly vague, with no conclusions or follow-up stories. The mystery deepened, and together, Mark and I began to dig deeper. We visited the local library, scrolling through microfilm for hours, unearthing more about our property and the surrounding neighborhood. When we casually mentioned our trips to the library, Mr. Grayson's face paled, and he excused himself quickly, muttering about a forgotten stove. He started avoiding our gazes, his usual greetings turning into mumbled words under his breath. Our research led us to old municipal records, which hinted at controversial land acquisitions and odd legal battles over the zoning and use of the land before our homes were built. We decided to confront Mr. Grayson with our findings, hoping to understand his cryptic warnings and uneasy behavior. As we approached his house, the sinking sun cast long shadows, and a sense of foreboding filled us. We knocked, the sound echoing slightly too loud in the quiet evening, unaware that we were about to uncover truths that might have been better left buried. Mark's patience had worn thin by the time we decided to confront Mr. Grayson about his increasingly bizarre behavior and the unsettling hints he had dropped. We found him in his garden, pruning his roses with meticulous care. As Mark stepped forward, his voice was firm. Mr. Grayson, we need to know what you meant about the land holding secrets. What's really going on here? The shears paused mid-snip, and for a moment, Mr. Grayson seemed to weigh his options before he sighed, a resigned slump to his shoulders. I suppose there's no avoiding it now, he said, leading us into his house. Inside, he pulled back a rug to reveal a trap door. This might explain better than I ever could, he said, his voice heavy. Descending into the dim light, we found ourselves in an extensive network of underground tunnels that stretched out beneath our neighborhood. The air was cool and musty, the walls lined with old wooden support beams and dusty cobwebs. As we ventured deeper, we discovered disturbing signs of recent activity, fresh footprints in the dust, a discarded cigarette butt, and hastily abandoned tools. Mr. Grayson watched us take it all in, his face itched with worry. Decades ago, this land was used for things that were less than legal. I was part of the construction crew back then, sworn to secrecy. We thought it was all shut down, but some of us kept an eye out, just in case. Our shock turned to horror as we realized the implications. So, these tunnels were used for what? Smuggling? Criminal activities? I asked, my voice echoing slightly in the confined space. Something like that he admitted, refusing to meet my gaze. And I think someone's trying to restart those activities. I was trying to scare you off before you stumbled into danger. Determined to bring this to light, we gathered evidence from the tunnels, photographs, the discarded items, and even some old documents we found in a sealed box. As we prepared to leave, Mr. Grayson blocked our path. You can't go to the police with this, he pleaded. There are people involved who wouldn't hesitate to silence anyone who tries to expose this. I'm trying to protect you. His fear was palpable, 
but it only strengthened our resolve. We can't let this continue, Mark asserted, stepping past him. It's bigger than just us or you now. With the evidence in hand, we climbed out of the darkness, ready to shed light on the shadows that lurked beneath our dream home. With a heavy heart, but unwavering determination, we approached the local police station, evidence in hand. We laid out the photographs, the documents, and recounted everything Mr. Grayson had revealed about the underground tunnels. The initial reaction from the officers was a mix of skepticism and shock, but as we persisted, the atmosphere shifted subtly. A few glances were exchanged, a certain unease settled in. It was clear that not all were surprised by the revelations. This hinted at a deeper complicity among some members of the force, suggesting that the roots of corruption might extend further than just the criminal elements directly involved in the tunnel activities. Despite these undercurrents of reluctance, the evidence was too concrete to ignore. Mr. Grayson was taken into custody, his resigned expression indicating he had anticipated this outcome. As he was led away, he turned to us, his eyes grave. Be careful, he cautioned. You've only scratched the surface. The real danger is still out there, buried deep. His words hung in the air, a chilling reminder that our actions might have unforeseen consequences. We left the police station with a complex mix of victory and trepidation, aware that while we had achieved a significant breakthrough, the path ahead might hold even greater challenges. The days following our visit to the police station brought a deceptive calm to our neighborhood. The streets were quiet, the rustle of leaves and the gentle breeze the only sound breaking the silence. Yet beneath this veneer of peace, Mark and I felt a persistent unease. Mr. Grayson's parting words echoed in our minds, a constant reminder that we had perhaps only unveiled the first layer of a much deeper conspiracy. Determined to protect our home and uncover the full extent of the corruption, we began planning our next steps. Late one evening, as we pored over the documents and photographs once more, we decided to not only focus on the tunnels but also on the possible involvement of the police. We knew that among those who had handled our case, there might be someone at a high level who was ensuring these secrets stayed buried. As we discussed our strategy in hushed tones, unaware of the watchful eyes observing us from a distance, an unnamed police officer stood in the shadows across the street. His presence was ominous, his intentions unclear, signaling that our troubles were far from over and that our pursuit of justice might lead us into even greater danger. This hidden observer, a direct link to the undisclosed threats Mr. Grayson had hinted at, set the stage for a story that was yet to unfold, promising more revelations and challenges ahead. Alex and I crossed the threshold of the old Victorian house, our hearts filled with a blend of awe and the thrill of new beginnings. Its towering presence in the quiet suburbs seemed to command respect, its ornate woodwork and sprawling ivy whispering stories of times long past. It was exactly the kind of home we had dreamed of, a place with character and history where we could plant roots and start our family. As I walked through each room, Touching the cool, elaborate moldings and peering out the large bay windows, I could almost hear the echoes of laughter and life that once filled these spaces. Alex, ever the dreamer, was already planning renovations and imagining our future children playing in the lush garden. It's perfect, Mia, he said with a smile that warmed the chilliest corners of the old home. On our second day, curiosity led us up the narrow attic stairs. The air was thick with dust and the scent of age, but it was the old leather-bound journals piled in the corner that caught my attention. Their covers were worn, the pages yellowed, a testament to their age and the hands that had turned them over the decades. I pulled one from the stack and opened it, the spine creaking like the house settling around us. The script was elegant, penned with an intensity that immediately drew me in. It was the diary of Charles, a former owner, who wrote with a fervent passion about his wife, Eleanor. But as I flipped through the pages, the tone darkened. Charles's adoration seemed to slip into obsession. His love tainted with a possessiveness that sent a shiver down my spine. Glancing over at Alex, who was exploring the other end of the attic, I tucked the journal under my arm. This discovery, I thought, might just tell us more about the home we had fallen in love with, revealing layers of its past that were not visible in the wood and stone. 
Little did I know, the words of Charles would soon begin to haunt me, threading a sense of foreboding through our hopeful dreams. As the days turned into weeks, my mornings began with coffee and Charles's journals. The more I read, the deeper I was drawn into the turbulent world of his love for Eleanor. His words were poetic, but fraught with an intensity that bordered on obsession. He spoke of Eleanor as if she were both a treasure to cherish and a possession to guard jealously against imagined threats. It was disturbing, yet I couldn't pull myself away. One chilly evening, as I sat reading by the fire, I came across an entry that chilled me to the bone. Charles had written, I know they whisper to her about me. The walls have ears and eyes. I shivered, trying to dismiss it as the paranoia of a troubled man, but I couldn't shake the feeling that someone might be watching me as well. That night, as I walked through the hallway, every shadow seemed to flicker unnaturally, and every creak of the old house sounded like footsteps following close behind me. My nerves frayed, and soon I began noticing things that I couldn't explain. Notes I didn't remember writing appeared on my desk. Be careful, one said. They're watching, said another. Whether they were pranks from my frazzled mind or something more sinister, I couldn't tell. But they mirrored Charles's accounts of receiving ominous messages. Alex saw the change in me. Initially, he was supportive, laughing off my fears as an overactive imagination fueled by too much time spent in Charles's headspace. But as my paranoia grew, so did his concern. I found myself jumping at the slightest sound, double-checking locked doors, peering into the shadows expecting to see eyes staring back. Mia, maybe you should take a break from those journals, Alex suggested one evening, his voice laced with worry. He missed our quiet evenings together, the simple joy of sharing our day's experiences. I knew he felt pushed aside, replaced by the ghost of a man who hadn't walked these halls in nearly a century, but I couldn't stop. There was something compelling about Charles's fear and love, something that resonated too closely with my own insecurities. Alex's presence became less comforting as my mind twisted normalcy into fear. Each day, his late returns from work made me anxious, and his unguarded phone seemed a beacon of secrets he might be keeping from me, just as Charles believed Eleanor had done. My relationship with Alex began to strain under the weight of my growing obsession and paranoia. The house, with its echoing halls and whispering walls, felt less like a home and more like a puzzle that I was desperate to solve, even if it meant losing everything else in the process. My obsession reached its peak late one stormy night when the wind howled like the wailing of a lost soul around the eaves of our Victorian home. The journal's last entries had become increasingly erratic and Charles's desperation to uncover truths he believed Eleanor hid from him echoed my own frantic need for answers. I was convinced that the house held secrets related to Eleanor's fate, secrets buried in its very bones. I roamed the house, ignoring the storm's cacophony outside, my mind racing with thoughts of hidden compartments, false walls, anything that might hold the answers Charles had sought. My every waking moment was consumed with finding the heart of this mystery, convinced that if I could just unravel this one thread, everything would make sense again. Alex found me in the attic, papers strewn around me, eyes wild with lack of sleep. Mia, this has to stop, he said, his voice firm but tinged with desperation. You're losing yourself to a ghost, to a story that isn't ours. The confrontation that followed was heated and full of pent-up frustrations. I accused him of not understanding, of not seeing how important this was. He shot back, hurt and angry decrying how I had let my fear in this obsession isolate me from him and from our life together. Our words, sharp and reckless, seemed to hang in the air, as heavy as the rain outside, driven by a mix of anger and a desperate need to prove myself. I stormed off to the one part of the house we hadn't fully explored, the cellar. There, behind old wine racks, I discovered a false wall. Trembling, I pried it open revealing a hidden room. Inside, amidst the dust and cobwebs, were Eleanor's personal effects, her diary among them. It chronicled her life with Charles, her fear of his jealousy, and her plans to leave him. A plan that, I learned, led to her tragic end during a confrontation 
much like the one I had just had with Alex. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. The parallels between Eleanor's fears and my own current reality sent a chill through me. I understood then how deeply I had been drawn into reliving Eleanor's nightmare. Sitting among the relics of her life, I realized how my obsession had almost driven me to the brink of losing everything I held dear. I returned to Alex, the journals and Eleanor's diary in my arms, tears streaming down my face. The truth about Charles and Eleanor was out, a grim reminder of how easily love could turn into something destructive. I had to make a choice, to let go of the past and hold on to the life and love I still had. As the storm subsided, Alex and I sat quietly together, the weight of our earlier words and my discovery pressing down on us. We both realized how dangerously close I had come to losing myself in Charles and Eleanor's story, letting their tragic past seep into our own lives. This ordeal was a stark reminder that the shadows of history can loom large, casting long, dark echoes across the years. It was a lesson in how obsessions, if left unchecked, can consume not only the obsessed, but also those they love. In the light of the revelations, our home felt different, as if acknowledging its past had somehow freed us both. We understood that to move forward, we needed to leave the haunting legacy of the house behind, embracing our future with open, vigilant hearts. As we packed our belongings, it was clear that the experience had left an indelible mark on me. It had taught me about the fragility of trust and the strength needed to confront and overcome our deepest fears. Moving forward, I carried with me a newfound resolve to cherish the present and to nurture the bonds that truly mattered. When Jack and I first saw the old house nestled on the edge of Willow Lane, it seemed like the perfect project for us. Charming, a bit run down, but affordable. We had always dreamed of renovating a house together, turning something forgotten into a place we could call home. So, with a mix of excitement and naivety, we signed the papers and moved in. Our adventure began in earnest a few days after settling in. Jack was peeling off layers of ancient wallpaper when he paused, his brow furrowed. Curious, I joined him and saw what had stopped him, a message scrawled on the plaster, barely legible under the dim light. Leave now. Chilled, we exchanged a glance, but our curiosity pushed us further. Beneath the creaky floorboards in the living room, we found another message. Don't dig deeper. These warnings ignited a debate between us. Should we heed these ominous cautions and halt our renovations, or should we dismiss them as pranks from a previous owner? Fear tugged at my heart, yet the mystery was too compelling to abandon. After a sleepless night, we agreed. It wasn't just our home we had bought, but a puzzle we needed to solve. Driven by a desire to uncover the secrets hidden within these walls, we decided to keep digging unaware of just how deep these roots went. Our renovation work continued cautiously, each day unearthing more than just dust and debris. One afternoon, as we pried up the wooden slats of the dining room floor, we discovered a stack of yellowed newspapers. The headline is blaring about a locale missing person case. It was chilling to read the details, realizing they were connected to our new home. The next day, there was a knock at the door that would plunge us deeper into the heart of the mystery. Detective Harris stood on our doorstep, his presence stern yet weary. He introduced himself, his voice heavy with unspoken stories. This house, he began slowly, belonged to my brother. He vanished without a trace five years ago. The connection was immediate and unnerving. As we invited him in, Detective Harris shared more about his brother, Tom, a journalist who had been investigating corruption within the local real estate industry. His research, it seemed, led him to some dangerous discoveries about a crime syndicate using properties for illicit activities. Discoveries that may have led to his disappearance. The last time anyone saw him, he was heading home, Harris explained, his eyes scanning the room as if he could still see his brother walking through it. I've always believed this house holds the key to what happened to him. His words hung in the air, dense with implication. The discovery of the newspapers suddenly felt like more than coincidence. They were a breadcrumb trail left behind, perhaps by Tom himself. Driven by a newfound resolve to help Harris find the truth, Jack and I agreed to aid in his investigation. As we delved deeper, 
The walls of our home seem to whisper secrets, each room revealing more than just architectural features, but echoes of a buried truth that refused to stay hidden any longer. Our investigation took a startling turn one rainy evening. As we were replacing some floorboards in the hallway, Jack's hammer struck something solid beneath the wood. Curious, we pried it open to reveal a hidden compartment. Inside, wrapped in a weathered cloth, was a ledger. Its pages were filled with names, dates, and amounts meticulously recorded. The names were of local officials and crime figures, tangled in a web of transactions that hinted at deep-seated corruption within the city's foundations. The gravity of our find hit us hard. This wasn't just any old paperwork. It was potentially explosive evidence that could topple powerful figures. Our initial thrill of discovery quickly soured as we realized we were holding a dangerous secret, one that others might go to great lengths to keep hidden. Almost as if on cue, strange occurrences began to disrupt our peace. Our tools went missing. The electricity was inexplicably cut off multiple times. And one night, a brick shattered our living room window with a note tied around it. Stop digging. Each event was more menacing than the last, escalating our fears that we were being watched, and more importantly, warned. The situation reached a peak when we found our dog, Max, barking ferociously at the back door one night. As I approached, I could make out a figure retreating into the shadows of our backyard. The realness of our peril couldn't be clearer. Detective Harris, when informed, insisted we take greater precautions. He arranged for surveillance on our property and suggested we might even need to go into temporary hiding if things got worse. But Jack and I, fueled by a stubborn resolve, decided to stay. We had unearthed this secret, and now we felt an overwhelming duty to see it through. Not just for our own sake, but for the memory of Harris's brother and the potential justice his silence demanded. We were no longer just renovating a house. We were trying to cleanse it of its corrupt legacy, one perilous clue at a time. Detective Harris, recognizing the escalating danger and the potential scope of the corruption we had uncovered, made the decision to involve federal authorities. He arranged a meeting in a nondescript government building downtown, where Jack and I nervously presented the ledger to a pair of serious-faced agents. The agents listened intently, flipping through the pages with increasing concern, and finally assured us they would take the matter seriously. They outlined a plan to use the information in our ledger as a starting point for a broader investigation into the Syndicate's activities. Back at home, the atmosphere had shifted palpably. Jack and I began noticing unfamiliar cars parked along our street at odd hours, their drivers obscured and unidentifiable. People we didn't recognize walked dogs past our house repeatedly, their glances too long to be casual. The quaint neighborhood we had moved into now felt like a landscape filled with unseen threats. Every stranger, a potential spy. The sense of intrusion reached a chilling climax one evening when troubleshooting a loose wire in the living room, I discovered a small, almost imperceptible camera hidden behind the light fixture. Horrified, we searched the rest of the house and found more. Tiny eyes peering from corners we had never thought to inspect. It became devastatingly clear that the Syndicate had been monitoring us inside our own home, watching our every move since we had discovered the ledger. This revelation forced us to confront the depth and reach of the criminal network we were up against. No longer could we pretend this was just about a few corrupted officials. This was an organized entity, watching and willing to intimidate to protect its secrets. The fear was palpable, but so was our resolve. Strengthened by the knowledge that federal agents were now involved in protecting us, we prepared for what might come next. Determined to end the cycle of corruption that had tainted our home and threatened our lives. With the Syndicate's eyes on us and their tactics escalating, Detective Harris proposed a bold plan. We would use the ledger as bait, inviting key Syndicate members to a meeting at our house under the guise of negotiating a sale of silence. Federal agents would be concealed throughout the property, ready to close in. On the day of the showdown, tension saturated the air. Hidden cameras were now in our favor, monitored by agents in a nearby van. As the Syndicate members arrived, their cautious glances betrayed their suspicion, but greed led them inside. Once all were assembled, and incriminating conversations began, Harris gave the signal. Agents stormed the house catching the criminals off guard. 
Amid the chaos, Harris directed us to a loose floorboard under, which we found his brother's journals. Chronicling his covert, investigations into the Syndicate. It was the piece of the puzzle we needed, the key to understanding the depth of the network and the danger Tom had faced. The arrests made headlines, shattering the Syndicate's influence in our town. The community, once unaware of the malignant forces operating beneath its surface, rallied around us. Jack and I were embraced not just as residents, but as catalysts of a newfound vigilance. Our home transformed into a beacon of resilience. As we restored each room, stripping away layers of deceit, we fortified it with our hope and renewed spirit. Inspired by the journey and the impact of our actions, we decided to document our story. Our book, aimed at inspiring others to stand against corruption, would tell of our transformation from ordinary homeowners into defenders of justice, illustrating that the heart of a community could be the strongest force against darkness. We arrived in the quaint coastal town on a sunny afternoon, the sea breeze promising a fresh start away from the chaotic city life we had known. I'm Mark, and alongside my wife Helen and our teenagers, Alex and Mia, we had just moved into an old house with a rich history. It was said to have once belonged to 19th century smugglers, a detail that added an air of mystery and excitement to our new home. It was Mia who stumbled upon the hidden entrance first. Hidden behind an old bookshelf in the basement, a wooden door crack had opened to reveal a dusty, narrow passage stretching into darkness. Our initial excitement was palpable. We joked about treasure maps and secret meetings, caught up in the romance of our home's adventurous past. With flashlights in hand, we decided to explore just a little, telling ourselves we were just getting to know every part of our new home. But as we ventured deeper, the whimsy of our adventure began to fade. The tunnels weren't just relics, they were still in use. We found modern tools, a clear sign of recent work, along with packages that seemed far too new to be leftovers from centuries past. Most unsettling were the faint footprints in the dust, leading further into the shadowy labyrinth. A chill ran down my spine as the reality set in. These tunnels, these remnants of a bygone era, were part of something very much alive and ongoing. Fear mingled with intrigue as we faced the undeniable fact that our family had just moved into the heart of a smuggler's active hideout. It was just past dusk when Alex whispered to me, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and thrill. Dad, let's see where it leads tonight. Against my better judgment, I agreed. We tiptoed down into the basement, followed the old smuggler's tunnels, and found ourselves at a hidden cove under the moonlit sky. What we saw chilled me to the bone. A group of men unloading boxes from boats, their contents hidden, but obviously illicit. We crouched behind the rocks, barely breathing, until the last of them had disappeared. With hearts pounding, we hurried back through the tunnels, the weight of what we had seen pressing down on us. The next morning brought no relief. A man, his face obscured by the shadow of his hat, approached me as I fetched the morning paper. His message was simple. Keep your family quiet about last night. Forget what you saw. The threat hung heavy in the air as he walked away. Later, Helen noticed a car that didn't belong in our small town cruising slowly past our house. By evening, another unfamiliar vehicle joined the first. The message was clear. We were being watched. Every creak of our old house that night sounded like a warning. By the third day of surveillance, Helen and I knew we couldn't go to the police. There was no telling how deep the smuggler's influence ran in our new town. Instead, we turned to an old friend, Peter, who had been a fisherman in these waters all his life. I trusted him with our lives as I explained our plan over a secure line. We need to get out using the smuggler's routes. Can you meet us? I asked. He didn't hesitate. I'll be there. Just tell me when. We chose the night of the next big shipment, knowing the smugglers would be preoccupied. That night would be our chance to escape this nightmare. We started to prepare, gathering our most important documents and a few belongings, each of us aware that if our plan failed, returning to our quaint coastal dream would be impossible. The night was moonless, the darkness almost palpable as we quietly packed our most essential belongings. Helen clutched the family photo albums while Alex and Mia grabbed backpacks filled with clothes and personal items. We couldn't take much, 
Speed was more critical than ever. We descended into the tunnels, the air thick with dampness and the echo of our cautious steps. I led the way, a flashlight our only guide through the snaking underground labyrinth that had terrified and fascinated us since our move. We dodged unfamiliar traps and evaded newly noticed surveillance cameras, evidence of a well-guarded secret route used by the smugglers. As we neared the exit, leading to the hidden cove, our path was suddenly blocked by two figures emerging from the shadows. Going somewhere, one sneered, his voice cold as the sea air. My heart raced, but my mind raced faster. I whispered a quick plan to Helen, who nodded, understanding immediately. She and the kids retreated a few steps, then loudly clattered a rock down a side passage as a decoy. As the smugglers turned towards the sound, we seized the moment. I lunged forward, pushing past them with a strength fueled by sheer desperation, leading my family towards the faint light of the exit. Our breaths were heavy as we emerged onto the rocky cove, the salt air hitting us with the harsh reminder of our peril. There, as promised, was Peter, his old fishing boat bobbing gently in the water. We wasted no time. The kids clambered aboard first, followed by Helen, and then myself. Just as the engine roared to life, shouts and the beam of flashlights sliced through the darkness behind us. The smugglers had realized our ruse. Hold on! Peter yelled over the noise as he skillfully navigated the boat away from the looming danger and out into the open sea. Safely away from the town, we contacted the federal authorities to report the smuggling operation. Thanks to the evidence we provided, the operation was dismantled. We relocated to a new state under new identities provided by witness protection. Though safe, our harrowing adventure left us wary but bonded closer than ever. A year later, we had adapted to our new life in a different part of the country. The story of our narrow escape circulated as an anonymous tale of courage and cunning, inspiring others facing threats to take bold actions for their safety. When Alex and I first saw the listing for our new home, we couldn't believe our luck. A sprawling 1920s farmhouse, nestled on the outskirts of town, priced as if it were begging for buyers. The real estate agent had mentioned a motivated seller, but as we drove down the long gravel driveway lined with ancient oaks, it felt more like a hidden gem than a desperate sale. The house sat on a slight hill, its white paint faded to a ghostly gray, shutters hanging a touch askew. There was an undeniable charm to it, a story waiting to be told. It's perfect, Alex had whispered, squeezing my hand with a grin as wide as the horizon beyond our new backyard. I returned his smile, my heart swelling with dreams of what could be. In the first few days of renovation, it became a game to peel back the layers of the house's past. Underneath wallpaper that bloomed with faded roses, we found hints of its century-old skeleton, horsehair plaster, lathe walls, and yes, even peeling lead paint. Each discovery was met with a mix of excitement and mild concern. They sure don't make them like they used to, Alex joked as he pried up floorboards, revealing asbestos tiles beneath. We laughed it off, caught up in visions of restoring the home to its former glory. But as we tore down old paneling and sanded floors, an unsettling silence settled over the house. It was as if the walls were holding their breath, watching us with the weary eyes of the past. Evenings were the eeriest. The wind whispered through the cracks, carrying the cold and lonely sounds of the countryside. We should have felt isolated, maybe even scared. But we were too enamored with our project, too wrapped up in the potential of our new life to heed the silent warnings. Little did we know, the real story of our home was buried, not in its walls, but in the ground beneath it. As the renovations progressed, so did an inexplicable feeling of incomfort. At first, Alex and I chalked it up to the long hours and dust clouds billowing from our work. Coughs and headaches became our constant, uninvited companions, and nights were restless with a fatigue that seemed too heavy for our youthful bodies. It's just the stress, I muttered one evening, rubbing my temples as Alex nodded, his eyes red from more than just the dust. <laughs> our concern spilled over during a trip to the local hardware store, where we hoped to find solace in conversation and practical advice. As we listed our symptoms to the elderly store owner, Mr. Jenkins, his face grew increasingly darker. You know, this land wasn't always just farmland, 
he began, his voice lowering. Back in the day, it was all industrial. Plants and factories, some of them not too careful with what they left behind. His words hung in the air, heavier than the humid summer heat. With a grave look, he added, might want to check your soil before going any further, just to be safe. His advice felt like a cold splash of reality. On our drive home, the countryside didn't seem quite as charming. Each rusted farm tool and overgrown field appeared as a testament to a forgotten, possibly sinister past. Taking Mr. Jenkins' warning to heart, Alex and I arranged for environmental specialists to test the soil surrounding our home. The waiting was agony, filled with unease and whispered fears. When the results finally came, they confirmed our worst fears. High levels of lead were just the beginning. The reports also detailed a slew of other industrial toxins, including a mysterious compound that the specialists couldn't immediately identify. Could this be why the house was so cheap? Alex asked, voice tight with anxiety. The question loomed large in the dusty air of our unfinished living room, unanswered, but increasingly obvious. Our dream home was turning into a nightmare, and the ground beneath it held secrets that were literally surfacing in our lives. Filled with a growing sense of duty, Alex and I organized a community meeting at the local town hall. We felt it was critical to share what we'd uncovered, fearing the scope of the contamination might extend beyond the borders of our property. The turnout was more significant than we had anticipated, with faces old and young reflecting a mix of curiosity and concern. As we presented our findings, the room's atmosphere thickened with tension and disbelief. After our presentation, a longtime resident, Mrs. Harrow, stood up. Her voice trembled as she recounted how her husband had succumbed to a mysterious illness years ago, one that doctors couldn't quite explain. One by one, others shared similar stories of chronic illnesses, unexplained ailments, and even deaths. The pattern was chilling, and a wave of anger and fear swept through the room. The gravity of our situation had just begun to sink in when the real opposition made itself known. The following days turned darker. It started with an anonymous letter slipped under our door, stark against the morning light. Stop digging where you don't belong. Dismissing it as a scare tactic, we tried to press on, but when our car was found with its tires slashed and a warning scratched into the paint, the message was clear. The worst came when our beloved dog Buster didn't come home one evening. We searched everywhere, our calls growing frantic as night fell. He was more than a pet. He was family, and his disappearance left a hollow fear in our hearts. The message was unmistakable. Someone powerful wanted us to back down, and they were willing to hurt us to make it happen. Despite the shadow of threats that loomed over us, Alex and I knew we couldn't retreat into silence. We reached out to the other affected neighbors, forging a coalition of the determined and the wronged. Among our newfound allies was Dr. Elise Moran, a local physician who had long suspected environmental causes behind the peculiar patterns of illness in our community. Together, we began documenting the health impacts systematically, compiling data and personal accounts into a compelling body of evidence. Dr. Moran organized health screenings, and her findings were stark. There's a clear link between these symptoms and the toxins you found, she confirmed during one of our strategy meetings. Her professional affirmation galvanized the group, and our mission felt more justified than ever. We weren't just fighting for our property values or peace of mind anymore. This was about our very lives. Our efforts culminated in another community meeting, this time charged with the urgency of our findings. The hall was packed, the air crackling with tension and anticipation. Midway through the meeting, as another resident shared a particularly emotional testimony, a heated exchange broke out on the floor. Accusations flew, fingers pointed, and in that heated moment, a startling revelation surfaced. Mark, a member of the community board, was exposed for his clandestine communications with BioCore, the corporation suspected of the initial pollution. Emails leaked by an anonymous source revealed his attempts to downplay our concerns and mislead the investigation. The betrayal was a harsh blow, shattering the fragile trust within our ranks. The room erupted into chaos, voices raised not only in anger but also in betrayal and fear. Yet as the initial shock faded, a resolute determination settled among us. Mark's treachery, rather than deterring us, only bound us closer together. With the mole revealed, we knew the lengths to which our adversaries would go. It was a declaration of war against our community's health and future, 
and we were more determined than ever to fight back. Our opportunity came when a whistleblower from Biocorp, moved by our plight and disgusted by the company's disregard for human life, reached out to us. She provided damning documents and emails that detailed decades of illegal dumping and deliberate cover-up of the contamination. Armed with this irrefutable evidence, we approached a seasoned environmental lawyer who specialized in corporate malfeasance. He was appalled by the extent of the wrongdoing and took on our case with a fervent zeal. Simultaneously, we contacted Carla Mendez, a tenacious local journalist known for her investigative prowess. When she published the first article detailing our story, complete with leaked documents and personal accounts, it sent shockwaves throughout the state. The media exposure was immediate and overwhelming. Other news outlets picked up the story, amplifying our plight into a national scandal. Public outcry grew, forcing regulatory bodies to step in. As the legal proceedings began, Biocorp faced mounting pressure from all sides. The evidence was too compelling, the public and legal scrutiny too intense for them to escape accountability. After months of grueling legal battles, the case concluded with a substantial victory for our community. Biocorp was ordered to pay a significant settlement to the affected residents, acknowledging their decades of suffering. Furthermore, the court mandated a comprehensive cleanup of the area. Funded by the corporation, but overseen by state environmental agencies to ensure compliance and transparency. As the news of the settlement broke, our community felt a collective relief. There was a sense of vindication, of justice finally being served after years of silent suffering. While the scars of our ordeal would remain, the resolution brought hope. We had not only secured a safer environment, but it also affirmed the power of community resilience and the impact of standing united against seemingly insurmountable odds. Tom and I had always been adventurers at heart, so when we found a house up for sale that had once hosted elaborate escape room games, it seemed like fate. It was our chance to merge our love for puzzles and mysteries with our new beginning. The house was perfect, sprawling, with an air of mystery, and nestled on the edge of town, where the whispers of its past could still be felt in the ornate, slightly dusty corners of each room. Our exploration led us to a peculiar room at the end of a long hallway. Unlike the rest of the house, this room was heavily themed, like stepping into another world. A captain's quarters on a pirate ship, complete with a sturdy wooden desk, nautical maps, and a large, ominous-looking chest. As we ventured in, marveling at the detail, the door clicked shut behind us with a definitive, automated sound. A quick test confirmed our suspicion. It locked automatically, and we were now unwitting participants in the last active game of the house. The thrill of discovery mixed with a hint of foreboding as we realized that escaping this room might require more than just a love for adventure. Tom's curiosity often led him ahead of me, and that day was no different. He had wandered into the themed room alone while I was still admiring an old portrait in the hallway. Suddenly, a sharp click echoed down the corridor, the sound of a door locking. Alarmed, I hurried towards the sound, reaching the room just as Tom pushed against the door from the inside his face confused and slightly pale. Sarah, it just locked itself, he called out, his voice muffled through the thick wood. Without thinking, I pushed the door open and stepped inside to help him, but no sooner had I crossed the threshold than the door slammed shut behind me, the lock clicking with a finality that made my heart skip. We exchanged a look of disbelief. Now, both trapped, the game was not just a pastime, it was a necessity. We needed to solve whatever puzzle lay ahead to find our way out. As Tom and I began assessing our surroundings, the initial puzzles presented themselves almost playfully. They involved a series of riddles and physical tasks, like aligning the compasses and flags according to the nautical maps that adorned the walls. Working together, we found our rhythm, each puzzle pushing us to think logically and rely on each other's strengths. The solutions led to hidden compartments in the room, revealing keys and cryptic notes that directed us to the next challenge. However, as we delved deeper into the heart of the room's mysteries, the tone shifted dramatically. We discovered a hidden monitor behind a panel on the wall, and when activated, it played grainy black and white video recordings. These were the previous occupants, couples, friends, individuals, all looking increasingly desperate and scared. 
some never shown leaving the room. The realization that not all had escaped sent a chill down my spine. The puzzles escalated, not just in difficulty but in danger. One involved bypassing a system of wires that, if touched incorrectly, triggered a mild electric shock. This wasn't just about fun and games. It was a test of endurance and nerve. Scattered among the props, we found academic papers and notes from someone who called himself the Watcher, detailing observations on human behavior under extreme stress. It was clear that this room was an experiment in psychological research, designed by someone with a deep, if not disturbing, interest in pushing human limits. Drawing on my background in psychology, I tried to think like the creator of this twisted game. This watcher was not just a puzzle master. He seemed to be a reclusive genius, using this setup to study fear, stress, and resilience. Each puzzle was crafted to heighten anxiety and force quick, stressful decision-making. Tom, I said, pausing to gather my thoughts. These aren't just puzzles. They're manipulations designed to break us down psychologically. We need to keep our wits and remember it's all just a test. Understanding this, we approached each new challenge with a renewed perspective. Not just solving puzzles, but also unraveling the mindset of the disturbed mind that had laid them out. This insight gave us a slight edge, keeping us one step ahead of panic as we prepared to face whatever came next. The puzzles morphed from intellectually challenging to physically perilous. One harrowing task involved a large mechanical contraption in the center of the room, its gears silently menacing. It was set with a timer, ticking down ominously, and linked to a series of levers and switches. The wrong move could potentially trigger a mechanism designed to snap shut, possibly causing severe injury. Tom and I studied the contraption, our minds racing against time. The solution involved a complex sequence of actions that needed to be executed perfectly. We had to rely completely on our trust in each other, as one misstep could have disastrous consequences. Our hands trembled as we carefully aligned each component, the sound of the ticking timer echoing in our ears. With seconds to spare, we pulled the final lever, and the device deactivated with a shuddering clang. The immediate danger averted. Breathing a sigh of relief, I noticed something peculiar. A small, almost imperceptible red light blinking from the corner of the room. A hidden camera was embedded in the wall, its lens fixed directly on us. It dawned on us then that our every move, every expression of fear or relief, was likely being monitored. This was more than a simple game. It was an ongoing experiment observing how we coped with extreme stress. The thought that someone might still be orchestrating these events from the shadows, watching our every move, added a chilling new layer to our predicament. This was not just a fight for freedom, it was a battle under the watchful eye of an unseen observer, making the stakes all the more real and terrifying. As we progressed, the sense of urgency became palpable. Hidden beneath the layers of nautical charts, Tom uncovered a digital display embedded into the captain's desk, its red digits counting down with ruthless precision. We hadn't noticed it before, masked by the room's elaborate decor. But now it was impossible to ignore. The clock was ticking down to what we feared was a permanent ceiling of the room. The reality that we could be trapped here indefinitely set our nerves on edge. With less than an hour left, we were forced to accelerate our pace. Each puzzle became a frantic race against time. I leaned into my understanding of psychological tactics, predicting the sequence of the puzzles based on the stress and decision-making models I'd studied. This room, this game, was designed to overwhelm and disorient its players, pushing them to their mental limits. Tom, with his knack for mechanics, became invaluable. His hands moved with precision over the intricate locking mechanisms and trap setups. At one point, a wrong calculation nearly triggered a ceiling panel to close down on us, but Tom's quick reflexes and technical acumen reversed the mechanism just in time. Our combined efforts were our greatest strength. We were striving not just to escape, but to outsmart the creator of this macabre experiment. As we solved each successive puzzle, the looming threat of the room's final lockdown motivated us to push through fear and fatigue, inching closer to what we hoped would be our escape. The final puzzle was the culmination of everything we had encountered so far, a complex cipher that sprawled across the room's far wall, 
composed of symbols and equations that seemed indecipherable at first glance. The digits on the countdown clock bled away as Tom and I threw ourselves into solving it, our minds weaving together threads of logic and intuition. As I decoded the symbols using patterns we'd noticed in earlier challenges, Tom tackled the mathematical side, his calculations a rapid whisper in the tense air. Finally, with mere minutes ticking down, we aligned the last symbol with its counterpart, triggering a soft click from the wall. Hidden behind a false panel, we found the manual override, a simple switch, unassuming yet powerful. I flipped it, holding my breath, and with a deep, grinding noise, the door unlocked, swinging open to our freedom. The relief was palpable, mixed with a triumph that surged through our exhausted spirits. As the door swung open, revealing the familiar hallway of our house, Tom and I stumbled out, our bodies and minds weary from the ordeal. The quiet of the home felt surreal after the relentless ticking and mechanical sounds of the escape room. We leaned against each other for support, grateful for our escape, but deeply shaken by the experience. Our immediate relief was quickly overshadowed by a resolve to understand the full extent of what had happened. Who had designed these puzzles with such malicious intent? Why were we chosen? We knew our journey wasn't over. It had merely shifted into a new phase of seeking answers and ensuring no one else would endure such a terrifying ordeal. In the days that followed, Tom and I worked with the police, combing through property records and the previous owner's belongings left in the attic. It became clear that our backgrounds in psychology and engineering hadn't just influenced our decision to buy the house. They had made us targets for the twisted research designed by the previous owner. The house hadn't found us by accident. But as we pieced together the chilling puzzle, a new, anonymous message arrived. Congratulations on passing the final test. The real experiment begins now. The words sent a cold shiver down my spine. Our escape had been only a prelude, suggesting that our true challenges lay ahead, masterminded by someone who was still watching still orchestrating from the shadows. The day we moved into the new apartment felt like a fresh start, a slice of the dream we'd been chasing for so long. Our new home was a spacious two-bedroom apartment bathed in sunlight, with a view overlooking a small, bustling park. Emily and I were overjoyed. We could already imagine our daughter Lily growing up here, making friends in the playground below. It was our little piece of paradise in the chaos of the city. As we started unpacking, a pile of unopened mail caught my attention, stacked neatly on the entryway table. It was all addressed to a Michael Harrow. We assumed forwarding his mail would be a simple act of courtesy, a final gesture to the apartment's previous tenant. But when I took the stack to the post office, the clerk's brow furrowed with confusion as she typed Michael's name into her system. I'm sorry, she said, glancing up at me with a hint of concern. But there's no forwarding address left for him. It's like he just vanished. Her words sent a chill down my spine, but I brushed it off as an overreaction. People move away without leaving a trace all the time, right? But as I walked back to our new home, the seed of unease had already been planted. Little did I know, that was just the beginning of a series of events that would turn our dream into a nightmare. A week had passed since we settled in, when the first threatening message arrived. It was a simple white envelope, unremarkable, but for the way my heart raced as I tore it open. Inside, a single piece of paper carried a hastily scrawled warning, return what you stole or pay the price. The note was signed with a menacing flourish, but no name was attached. Initially, I thought it was a mistake or a cruel joke. After all, we were just a family trying to make a home. But seeing Michael Harrow's name at the top of the note my stomach nodded with anxiety. Someone out there believed Michael, or someone in this apartment, had wronged them significantly. The threat was clear, and it was meant for him, not us. Yet with Michael gone and no way to contact him, the shadow of his past actions had fallen squarely on us. As days turned into weeks, the messages grew more frequent and violent. One morning we found a rock thrown through our living room window, with a note tied around it. Last warning. Shards of glass littered the floor like icy fragments of our shattered security. Emily's hands trembled as she swept them up, her eyes wide with fear. 
we started keeping the curtains drawn and double-checked the locks at night. But the sense of safety we'd once felt in our new home had eroded completely. One evening, while returning from a late shift, I felt the distinct sensation of being watched as I approached our building. The street was unusually quiet. The usual hum of city life dimmed as if holding its breath. As I fumbled for my keys at the building entrance, two figures stepped out of the shadows. Michael, you can't hide, one of them hissed, grabbing my arm with a startling strength. Panic surged through me as I struggled, but it was their next words that froze me in place. We know it's you, Michael. It's time to pay up. They were mistaking me for Michael Harrow. My heart pounded in my ears as I managed to break free, staggering back. I'm not Michael, I shouted, my voice echoing down the empty street. They paused, confusion briefly crossing their faces before they advanced again. It took all my courage and a sudden desperate sprint to escape them, ducking into a nearby cafe and calling the police. The police took statements but offered little comfort. They suggested that these people might not believe or care that I wasn't Michael. The realization was a gut punch. Not only were we living in Michael's shadow, we were now targets in whatever dangerous game he had left behind. Frustrated with the minimal help from the police, I decided to take matters into my own hands. The constant threat hanging over our heads was unbearable, and if the authorities wouldn't dig deeper, I would. I started by visiting the local library to access public records and newspaper archives. Hours of searching led me to a startling discovery. Michael Harrow had been a key witness in a high-profile trial against a notorious local criminal syndicate. His testimony had led to several arrests, but some members were still at large, their activities merely disrupted, not dismantled. The pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. Michael hadn't just left a forwarding address, he had disappeared to escape retribution, and now, these criminals were after him, thinking he might still have evidence that could incriminate them further. Or worse, that I was Michael. My research uncovered more than I bargained for, dragging my family deeper into a dangerous situation. It was clear that these were not people you could simply hide from. They had resources, and they had motivation. As I sat amidst piles of old newspapers and legal documents, the weight of our predicament settled in. We were caught in the crossfire of Michael's unfinished business, and it was up to me to find a way out. One night, the illusion of safety was shattered when we returned home to find our apartment door ajar. Heart pounding, I led Emily and Lily inside with trepidation. It quickly became apparent that though our belongings were tossed about, nothing was taken. This break-in was a demonstration of our vulnerability. Our home had become the front line of a war we never wanted to fight. The following day brought an unexpected visitor. An FBI agent named Agent Thompson showed up at our doorstep. He revealed that Michael Harrow had been placed in the witness protection program after his testimony, which had led to a significant disruption of the Syndicate's operations. The resemblance between Michael and me was an unfortunate coincidence that had escalated the threat against us. Agent Thompson explained that the Syndicate likely believed Michael was still alive and hiding, possibly even that he had staged his disappearance to live freely under their noses. This mistaken identity placed us directly in their crosshairs. He offered FBI protection, but the thought of uprooting our lives was overwhelming. With the FBI now involved, our situation took a turn. It was no longer just about evading danger. It was about actively engaging with federal authorities to dismantle the lingering threat of a powerful enemy. Agent Thompson's presence offered a glimmer of hope, but the road ahead promised to be fraught with peril. The crisis peaked one evening as I was ambushed while taking out the trash. Swift and silent, masked figures grabbed me. A cloth doused in chemicals clamped over my face, plunging me into darkness. When I awoke, I was bound in a dimly lit, unfamiliar room, the stench of mildew in the air. My captors, rough and impatient, demanded information they believed Michael had hidden, documents that could further incriminate members of their syndicate. Desperation clawed at me, but a sliver of strategy took hold. I realized that maintaining the pretense of being Michael might buy the FBI time to locate us. I'll talk, but you won't get anything if something happens to me. I rasped, trying to emulate what I imagined Michael's demeanor would be. 
My heart hammered as I played the part, each second stretching taut with danger, hoping my act would be convincing enough to keep me alive until rescue arrived. The gamble paid off. While I stalled, the FBI, using the bits of information I'd managed to provide before the kidnapping, traced my location to an abandoned warehouse on the city's outskirts. The hours I spent in captivity were agonizing, filled with a mix of fear and feigned confidence. Each minute felt like an eternity as I awaited either my end or my rescue. The rescue came with the intensity of a storm. Flashbangs erupted, disorienting my captors as FBI agents stormed the warehouse. In the chaos, I barely registered the shouts and the sounds of struggle until Agent Thompson cut through my restraints, pulling me to safety. In the aftermath, our family grappled with the echoes of terror that had invaded our lives. The apartment, once a symbol of new beginnings, now felt haunted by the events that transpired within its walls. We decided to move, seeking a fresh start away from the shadows of the past. The FBI's investigation eventually uncovered that Michael Harrow had indeed died shortly after entering witness protection. His death, obscured by secrecy to protect the investigation, had now been avenged with the dismantling of the syndicate that targeted him. As we packed to leave, I discovered a loose tile in the bathroom. Behind it was a note from Michael, his handwriting shaky. I'm sorry to whoever finds this. I brought danger to this place. Leave before they mistake you for me. His words, a chilling reminder of our entanglement in his fate, urged us forward to our new life, away from the remnants of his. The operation led to the arrest of key syndicate leaders, significantly crippling their operations. As we drove away from the scene, the relief was palpable, but so was the realization of how close we had come to disaster. The threat was neutralized, and finally, we could breathe again, the weight of constant fear lifting slowly from our shoulders. The day we moved into the old house on Maple Street was filled with a mixture of excitement and exhaustion. I remember looking up at the towering Victorian, its windows like eyes, and the porch welcoming us, despite a layer of dust and the passage of time. It was our new beginning, a place we could call home. As we unpacked, the house revealed its character. Creaky floorboards that sang under our feet, wallpaper that held the scent of decades, and a staircase that spiraled upwards like a question mark. It was during one of my explorations, a week after we'd settled in, that I stumbled upon the hidden room. I was in the basement, a place more for storage than living, illuminated by the dim light of a single bulb. That's when I noticed it, a peculiar outline in the wall, slightly ajar, begging for attention. Pushing against it, the false wall gave way to reveal a space that time had forgotten, a hidden room untouched, furnished with relics of a past life, a sturdy desk, a faded armchair, and shelves filled with trinkets and books. A layer of dust coated everything like a blanket preserving history. Initially, I felt like an intruder peeking into a world not meant for my eyes. Yet, there was an allure, an unspoken story lingering in the air. My family suggested we might clean it out, maybe turn it into something new. But something held me back. I couldn't shake off the feeling that the room wanted to be discovered, that it had secrets waiting to be unveiled. Though we decided to leave the room as it was for the moment, it drew me in. I found myself standing at the threshold often, peering into the darkness, listening. It felt as if the room was calling to me, whispering secrets I couldn't yet understand but was destined to uncover. A series of peculiar occurrences that I couldn't simply brush aside as quirks of an old house. It began subtly, with whispers that danced through the corridors at night. So faint I thought them figments of my imagination, stirred by the wind. But these whispers grew more distinct as if someone was murmuring secrets just beyond the edge of understanding. Objects too started to move inexplicably. Books I had placed on a shelf in the living room would be found on the kitchen table the next morning and a vase of flowers shifted positions on the mantelpiece, always when our backs were turned. More unsettling was the coldness that settled in certain parts of the house, an icy grip that no amount of heating could dispel, most notably around the hidden room's entrance. Driven by a mix of fear and intrigue, my fascination with the hidden room and its mysteries turned into an obsession. I felt compelled to learn more about the house and its previous inhabitants. The local library and online archives became my sanctuaries where I pored over old property records, 
newspaper clippings, and any scrap of information that could shed light on the house's history. My research led me to the troubling story of the house's former owner, a wealthy man known as much for his reclusiveness as for the rumors that swirled around his wife's sudden and unexplained disappearance. The more I learned, the more I felt an inexplicable connection to her, a woman whose voice had been silenced, whose presence seemed to linger in the very walls of our home. Delving deeper, I uncovered old letters and diaries in the local history society's archives, written by or about the people who had lived in the house. These documents hinted at a life filled with isolation and despair, particularly for the wife. It was in these moments of reading her words, feeling the echo of her loneliness, that I understood. She must have been the last occupant of the hidden room. The room, with its stale air and lingering sadness, seemed to hold the essence of her, a snapshot of her life and the desperation that must have filled her final days. This connection formed across decades compelled me to seek the truth not just about the hidden room, but about the woman who had become as much a part of the house as the foundations it was built upon. Her story, buried and nearly forgotten, was waiting to be told, and I felt an overwhelming responsibility to be the one to tell it. The breakthrough came unexpectedly one evening as I was drawn once more to the hidden room, a magnetism I could neither explain nor resist. As I stood in the threshold, the whispers seemed to surround me, urging me closer. Guided by an unseen force, my hand brushed against the cold, dusty wall where my fingers found the outline of a loose brick. Heart racing, I carefully removed it, revealing a hidden compartment that had been concealed within the wall for decades. Inside, wrapped in a thin layer of cloth to protect it from the ravages of time, was a small leather-bound diary. Its pages were yellowed with age, the ink faded but still legible, bearing the intimate thoughts and fears of the missing wife. Beside the diary lay a delicate piece of jewelry, a locket, tarnished by time but unmistakably precious. I opened it to find a portrait of a woman, her eyes hauntingly familiar, filled with an unspoken sorrow. It was her, the woman whose presence permeated the house. With trembling hands I began to read the diary, each entry drawing me deeper into her world. She wrote of her love for the house and her dreams for the future, but as the pages turned, those dreams were overshadowed by fear. She had discovered her husband's dark secrets, which she alluded to in cryptic entries, too frightened to detail them fully. Her writing grew more desperate, the tone more frantic, as she realized the danger she was in. The final entries were filled with plans to escape, to find freedom from the suffocating walls of her opulent prison. It was in these pages that I found the connection I had been seeking, a bond formed through the shared experience of uncovering hidden truths. The diary was not just a recounting of her life. It was a plea for help, a message sent across time hoping to find someone who would listen. In the weeks that followed my discovery, would detective friend, a seasoned man with a keen eye for the overlooked, became my unexpected ally in the quest for truth. Together we delved into the diary's cryptic messages, deciphering the hidden fears and secrets it contained. It was clear the husband harbored a darker side, his wealth and status concealing a web of criminal activities. The wife's growing awareness of his dealings had sealed her fate. Our research took us beyond the confines of the diary and the hidden room, into the heart of the husband's clandestine world. We uncovered financial records, letters, and testimonies from those who had once moved in the same circles as the couple. Pieces of a puzzle that, when assembled, painted a damning picture of guilt. The evidence suggested that the wife had planned to expose her husband, a decision that led to her disappearance. Armed with our findings, we approached the authorities. The evidence was compelling, enough to convince them to reopen a case that had long been considered unsolvable. Skeptical but intrigued, they agreed to reopen the investigation, using the diary as new evidence. The diary, with its intimate recounting of fear and betrayal, became the cornerstone of the investigation. The locket, once a personal memento, served as a silent witness to the life that had been lost. The legal process was arduous, fraught with challenges as we sought justice for a crime that had occurred decades ago. As days turned into weeks, the investigation unearthed truths that had been buried for too long. The husband, though deceased, was posthumously implicated in the disappearance of his wife and presumed death, a symbolic gesture that nonetheless brought a sense of closure to a case that had haunted the community. As I stood outside the courtroom, the weight of the months-long journey pressing down on me, 
I realized the significance of what we had achieved. It was not just about solving a mystery or uncovering a hidden room's secrets. It was about giving voice to someone who had been silenced, about righting a wrong that had lingered in the shadows of history. I couldn't help but feel that this was a sign. The spirit of the wife, once trapped in a loop of sorrow and fear, had found peace at last. The house, once a symbol of fear and mystery, now represented something more. It was a reminder of the resilience of the human spirit, of the power of truth to transcend time and bring peace to those who had been wronged. Life in the house now feels markedly different. The air in our home felt lighter, as if a weight had been lifted from the very foundations of the house. There's a tranquility that permeates every room, a sense of closure that has mended the fabric of our family's existence here. Our evenings are no longer disturbed by unexplained occurrences. Instead, they're filled with laughter and the comforting sounds of a home at peace with its past. I am Sarah. Originally from a small town, I moved to the city with dreams of independence and a fresh start. I always been a blend of introverted and adventurous, enjoying my own company but also eager to explore new experiences. After looking for a long time, I finally found the perfect apartment in the city. The apartment seemed almost too perfect. It was on the ground level. It had one bedroom, one bathroom, a small living room and a kitchen. Just what I wanted and what I could afford to start living on my own. The place was empty at first, waiting for me to fill it with my things and make it alive. As I set up my stuff, the apartment began to feel really mine. I didn't have a problem with filling up the space with the furniture that I had, and I didn't even have that much stuff. Every box I emptied and every spot I cleaned helped me move on from the past. As the evening came, I started to relax in the way I love most. I played some of my favorite tunes, filling my new place with music. After a long day of getting things in order, I really looked forward to a hot shower. It felt amazing to wash away all the tiredness and stress. Then, I made myself a warm cup of matcha tea, my go-to drink. Holding the cup, I settled down in a cozy spot among the boxes still to be unpacked. I was all set to binge watch my favorite series on Netflix. This was my way of celebrating my first day here, letting go of everything else. It felt like the ideal way to wrap up the day. Somebody was knocking on my front door and glancing at the clock, I saw it was almost 10 p.m. Why would anybody be knocking on my door? I sat up and flicked on the bedroom light. It was odd for anyone to visit at this hour. I got up, walked into the living room, and turned on the light before asking, Who's there? A voice outside claimed to be the building's handyman. Opening the door, I was met by a man in his forties. Although not particularly tall, his presence felt imposing, charged with an unsettling vibe. His unkempt beard and deep-set eyes, flickering with an indescribable intensity, made him all the more intimidating. Over his shoulder hung a heavy, worn-out bag, filled with tools that made a soft clanging with each of his movements. Oh, hi there. I wasn't expecting anyone at this hour. Is everything okay? I asked, trying to mask my unease. Yes. All good. Just wanted to ensure your lights and Wi-Fi are working. It's important to stay connected, especially in a new place, he responded, his voice oddly comforting, yet out of place. There was something reassuring about not being entirely isolated, yet his thorough inspection of the apartment, under the guise of checking connections, reminded me starkly of my solitude. Yet, as his footsteps echoed a bit too closely, I was feeling like creeping unease. But then, something unusual happened. He said he needed to test the Wi-Fi a few more times and asked to use my computer to do it. At first I thought nothing of it, but then he kept finding reasons to stay longer and test it again and again. It started to feel a bit odd, him lingering around, diving into my computer under the guise of checking the connection. This twist turned my evening into a mix of appreciation and a niggling worry, making me wonder about the real reason he was insisting on using my computer so much. He finally left. As the night grew darker and quieter, I couldn't shake off a feeling of being watched. It was an eerie feeling, as if eyes were on me from somewhere unseen, watching every move I made. This wasn't the comforting familiarity of being at home, 
It was an invasive, prickling awareness that I wasn't truly alone. The building's natural creaks and the shifting shadows from my TV seemed charged with sinister intent, suggesting a presence always just beyond my sight. Despite this sensation, my body's need for rest overpowered my fears. The day had been long and filled with both the physical exertion of setting up my new home and the emotional strain of adapting to this unfamiliar space. I found myself drifting off to sleep. Small, almost imperceptible sound. A soft click, like a lock being turned, jolted me back to alertness. I lay there, heart pounding, straining to hear over the thud of my own heartbeat, wondering if it was just my imagination or if something or someone was indeed inside my apartment. The next day when I woke up, everything seemed perfectly fine. Days went by. I was gone for most of the day at work and back at the end of the day. I saw the handyman around the building a few times, and each time he seemed to look at me in a weird way. Once he told me he really likes my paintings hanged in the apartment. I found that really odd since he'd never been in my apartment. After the strange situation, I didn't want to confront him for some reason. I didn't feel all that safe around him. I was super excited for the weekend because my sister and her boyfriend was going to visit me for the first time. Then, on Saturday, suddenly all my lights went out. I quickly called the building's service. And guess what? They sent over the same handyman again. He came into my apartment and immediately shut the door behind him. He took a quick look around, almost like he wanted to make sure we were alone. Something about him just didn't feel right. Despite this, I tried to keep my distance and retreated to the kitchen, hoping to avoid any unnecessary interaction. Suddenly, I sensed someone right behind me. I could even hear them breathing. Before I had a chance to turn around, the man grabbed me, covering my mouth with his large hand, silencing my attempts to scream. He whispered threateningly that he would hurt me if I didn't stop trying to scream. Frozen with fear, I couldn't move or make any noise. The shock of the situation left me paralyzed, unable to scream or even move. Then, with a swift motion, he sealed my mouth with tape dragging me towards my bedroom. The suddenness and intensity of his actions left me in a state of shock, my mind reeling in disbelief at the nightmarish turn of events. As an ultimate survival instinct, hoping someone might hear and help, I tried to make noise by tapping my feet on the floor. I thought maybe a neighbor or someone walking by would hear the tapping and know something was wrong. My mind raced for solutions. Just as the handyman started to drag me toward the bedroom, the unexpected happened. The doorbell rang. It kept ringing, urgently. And then I heard my sister's voice, clear and unmistakable, from the other side of the door. We're here, she called out. Startled, he paused, his grip momentarily loosening. He suddenly jumped through the open window and disappeared. It was clear the handyman knew his way around the place too well. The doorbell was my sister and her boyfriend's doing. They had arrived earlier than planned. Their timing couldn't have been more perfect. As soon as I opened the door, she could tell something was terribly wrong. Despite being disoriented and scared, I explained to them everything that had happened. We called the police immediately. While waiting for them to arrive, my sister hugged me tight, trying to calm my shaking body. I was overwhelmed with relief and gratitude for her unexpected arrival. The police looked for the handyman when they arrived, but couldn't find him. It turned out he had a history of criminal behavior that none of us in the building were aware of. The police arrived and started looking around my apartment. They found out something really scary. When the handyman was here the first time to check the Wi-Fi, he actually messed with my computer to get access to my webcam. This meant he could watch me without me knowing. All those times I felt like someone was watching me. I was right. He turned my own computer into a spy tool. This made me feel even more upset and betrayed. I've always cherished solitude. Amid the bustling chaos that defined urban living, I found my peace in the quiet moments. Early mornings when the city still slumbered. Late nights when the streets emptied of their daily throngs. This love for tranquility guided my decision to move to a new city, a place where I could start over with a clean slate, where memories didn't cling to the corners of buildings and faces in the crowd were all unfamiliar to me. Here, 
in this sprawling metropolis that buzzed with strangers, I sought my fresh start. I relished the anonymity, the freedom to rebuild myself away from the prying eyes of a past that had become too heavy to bear. My new apartment was a modest but cozy space, nestled on the quieter side of town. Work became a necessary intrusion into my carefully curated isolation, a demanding job that nonetheless offered the routine I had craved. It was predictable, manageable. Life, for a few precious months, felt pleasantly uneventful. However, I would soon learn the tranquility of the fragile state. It began with a niggling sensation, the kind that tugs at the edges of awareness. A car, nondescript and black, lingered a little too long in my rearview mirror as I drove home from work. Once, twice, perhaps it was nothing. A coincidence of timing, I told myself. But as days bled into weeks, the car's presence wove itself into the fabric of my daily commute unsettling shadow trailing my movements. Initially, I dismissed the feeling, chiding myself for succumbing to baseless paranoia. Yet the human mind is finely tuned to detect patterns, and what I pieced together refused to be ignored. The repetition of the car's appearances, always a few turns behind, transformed my dismissal into concern. This unease was new, an unfamiliar weight in my stomach. I had moved to escape ghosts, only to find myself haunted by a very real specter in the form of a vehicle that seemed as much a part of my journey home as the streets I navigated. In the weeks that followed, my home, once a bastion of safety, began to betray me. It started so small and inconsequential that I could almost convince myself I was imagining things. A book misplaced. Not on the shelf where I was certain I'd left it, but on the coffee table. My keys, always hung by the door, found in the kitchen, these discrepancies niggled at me, sowing seeds of doubt in the routines I had so meticulously established. Then, there was the scent, an odd, indefinable aroma that didn't belong. It was neither unpleasant nor familiar, a melange of something metallic mixed with the earthiness of aftershave, lingering in the air like a ghostly presence. It clung to my living room some evenings, greeting me as I returned from work, a silent testament to an uninvited visitor. Most disturbing, however, was the shadow. On one particularly ordinary evening, as I moved about my kitchen, a movement at the periphery of my vision caught my attention. A fleeting glimpse of something or someone passing by my living room window. I froze, my heart hammering, and rushed to peer outside, only to find the street empty, bathed in the orange glow of the streetlights. The curtains, I could have sworn, were drawn when I had gotten home. Confusion turned to fear, and fear bred isolation. I reached out, first to friends, then to the local police, in search of explanations, validation, or perhaps just to hear someone else say they believe me. But reassurance was scant. Friends offered well-meaning platitudes, suggesting perhaps I was overworked, stressed, or simply not yet accustomed to my new home. The police were polite but clear, without evidence of forced entry or theft. There was little they could do. They left me with a pamphlet on home security and suggestions to change my locks, but no real solace. This lack of belief, this dismissal of my concerns, left me adrift in my own mind, questioning my sanity. The solidity of my reality, once unquestionable, now seemed permeable, subject to distortions that left me grappling for truth. Nightfall brought no relief. Each creak and whisper of my apartment a potential herald of unseen intrusion. Sleep, when it came, was fitful, plagued by dreams of shadows and the sensation of being watched. I found myself caught in a space where the boundary between the real and imagined blurred. The solitude I once sought now felt like a sentence, a confinement with my burgeoning fears for company. The very walls that were meant to protect me seemed complicit in my torment, keeping silent vigil over my unraveling. In this state of heightened vigilance, I began to see my world through a lens tinted with suspicion and dread. Every unexplained sound, every slight anomaly in my home's order became evidence of my unseen adversary's presence. This escalation of events did more than just invade my personal space. It breached the fortress of my mind, planting seeds of terror that took root deep within my psyche. I was left to navigate a reality where the line between paranoia and legitimate fear became increasingly indistinguishable. 
Determined to confront my fears head on, I steeled myself for the inevitable encounter. It came on an evening painted with the strokes of an ordinary sunset, the kind that previously would have passed without remark. The black car, its presence now a constant in the tapestry of my daily life, was there again. This time, however, it followed me all the way to my parking lot, unraveling the last thread of my patience. With a courage born of desperation, I approached the vehicle, my steps echoing in the silent street. The driver's door opened, and out stepped a figure, shrouded in the dimming light. A man, unfamiliar, his features cast into shadow by the failing light, stood before me. My heart raced, not with fear, but with a burning need for answers. I'm not here to hurt you, the stranger began, his voice laced with an urgency that made me pause. I'm trying to protect you. Before I could fully process his words, a sudden disturbance shattered the moment, a noise from my apartment. Together, we rushed towards my home, an uneasy truce between us forged in the face of a common threat. What we discovered inside turned my world on its head. Hidden cameras, expertly placed to capture every corner of my living space, blinked back at us. The invasion I had felt, the eyes I had sensed upon me, had not been the imaginings of a mind pushed to the brink. They were real. But the man before me, whom I had labeled as my stalker, was just as much a victim. He explained hurriedly how he had noticed the car first, how his attempts to warn me had been misinterpreted. He too had felt the weight of unseen eyes, noticing similar devices in his own home after he had taken an interest in my safety. The realization dawned on me like a cold wave. The true architect of our fear remained cloaked in the shadows of anonymity, manipulating us both in a sinister game of voyeurism. The presence of the cameras, their silent testimony to countless observed moments, suggested a plot far more disturbing than a simple case of stalking. Someone, for reasons unknown, was orchestrating our fears, feeding off our paranoia like a parasite. This twist of fate, the revelation that my presumed stalker was, in fact, an ally, forced me to reassess my situation. Together, we faced not just the invasion of my privacy, but a deeper, more pervasive threat. The identity of our watcher, the mastermind behind the lenses, remained a mystery. One that promised to unravel the very fabric of our reality. With the revelation that my stalker was, in fact, another pawn in this disturbing game, I found myself in an unlikely alliance. The man, whom I learned was named Lucas, shared my determination to unearth the identity of our observer. Together, we embarked on a mission fueled by the need for answers and justice, a mission that would require all our cunning and bravery. Our first step was to trace the origin of the surveillance equipment. It was a painstaking process, involving late-night research sessions, poring over manuals, and following the tangled web of technology that had invaded our lives. We discovered that the devices were not the off-the-shelf variety, but rather specialized equipment that required professional knowledge to install and operate. This clue narrowed our list of suspects significantly. As we delved deeper, we uncovered a network of signals that led us to a most unexpected source. Our neighbor, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson was a retiree, a seemingly benign presence in the building who often greeted us with a smile and small talk about the weather. His demeanor was the perfect cover for the malice that lurked beneath. Confronting Mr. Thompson required a plan. We could not simply accuse him without undeniable proof of his involvement. Thus Lucas and I decided to turn the tables on our watcher. Using our newfound knowledge, we tampered with the surveillance equipment, sending false signals to lead Mr. Thompson into a trap. The trap was set in my apartment, the scene of so many violations of my privacy. We waited, tense and silent. As Mr. Thompson took the bait, he entered the apartment, confident in his control over the situation, only to find Lucas and me waiting for him, our faces grim with accusation. The confrontation that followed was tense. Mr. Thompson, realizing his scheme had unraveled, oscillated between denial and anger before finally breaking down and confessing. His motives were as chilling as they were unfathomable. He spoke of a twisted obsession with me, a desire to control and manipulate my environment to make me dependent on him. He saw himself as a guardian, 
albeit one who had crossed into the realm of criminality. Lucas and I listened, horror-struck by the depth of Mr. Thompson's delusion. We had expected to confront a predator, but what we found was a man lost in his own distorted reality. Yet, the danger he posed was no less real. With the confession secured, we called the police, who arrived to take Mr. Thompson into custody. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. The immediate threat had been neutralized. Mr. Thompson was now in the hands of the authorities, his array of surveillance equipment confiscated, and his intentions laid bare. The ordeal had left scars, undoubtedly, but also a resilient bond between two strangers who had become allies in the face of adversity. But just as I began to envision a return to normalcy, a chilling reminder of my vulnerability arrived. A text message from an unknown number pierced the fragile bubble of my newfound security. You think you've won, but you're still being watched. The message was cryptic, its source untraceable, reigniting the ember of fear that I had fought so hard to extinguish. In the ensuing days, my efforts to trace the message proved futile. It was as if the sender existed in the shadows, beyond the reach of light. This realization, that our victory over Mr. Thompson might have been but a battle in a larger war, cast a long shadow over my recovery. As the final words of my ordeal whispered into silence, I found myself drawn to the window, gazing out into the night. The city stretched out before me, a maze of lives unknowingly observed, each light a potential eye, each shadow a concealment for darker intents. My reflection in the glass, superimposed on this panorama, served as a poignant metaphor for the duality of my existence.